Um, I think we're going to start now. We are just waiting for the main man, Sanchit, uh, to turn up. Um, he's just gone somewhere. He'll be back in in a second. Uh, I, I'm I'm just kind of here to to to. Um, um, I think we're going to start now. We are just waiting for the main man, Sanchit, uh, to turn up. Um, he's just gone. It's quite nice, yes, actually. He'll be back yeah. in, in a second. Uh, I, I'm I'm just kind of here to... to, to How do we uh, stop this uh, echo? I think we're going to start now. We're just waiting for the main man, Sanchit, uh, to turn up. Uh, he's just gone. It's quite nice, yes, actually. He'll be back on a loop in, in a second. I, I'm I'm just kind of here to. to yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, was uh, echo. I think we're going to start. We're just waiting for the main man, Sanchit, uh, to turn up. Uh, he's just gone. It's quite it's nice. Like, actually, like he become a found. Uh, music. It's a found music. I, I'm I'm just kind of here to. Really yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, was uh, echo. I think we're going to start. We're just waiting for the main man, Sanchit, uh, to turn up. Uh, well done. I feel like clapping. I, I'm, I'm just going to hear to... Can you... 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 Well done. I've been practicing this, but, you know, I didn't realize that it would come through with such perfection. This particular opening, I've been rehearsing it with the, with these guys. So they, they, they did it well. Um, so, um, yeah, just, just to say that before we start, um, um, that, uh, the, the books that are coming out from, or have come out from the, um, literary activism imprint are on display over there. And there's one copy of Against Storytelling, which is one of the two books which will come out next month from the imprint. Uh, unfortunately, they're not for sale because, um, we are not allowed to sell books right now over here. So, for, but for you to see, um, and if you're curious, um, they're on sale elsewhere. And um, we've had a live streaming sort of uh, thing going on this time. Um, I, I've been trying to keep it under wraps as far as Ashoka students are concerned, because we want people to come to the venue. But we did have uh around 300 people watching on youtube yesterday and i've got sort of uh, messages from um people artists and writers that i know in say in germany or the uk writing in so that's that that was nice it's, i i mention it because it's for us it's a it's a new thing we've never done it before so uh, now we will get going with the talks sanchit will introduce um the speak uh, the chair um, hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to those of you who are joining us for the first time today, and welcome back to those of you who are here for the second day of the Nine Symposium in the Literary Activism Series, uh, the first session of the day uh, by Professor uh, Tim Beasley Murray is titled Going for Burst, Bolliano, the Broken Conference, and Deep Play. Uh, Professor Josefa Omer Siddiqui is going to be chairing the session, and I'm going to introduce him. Uh, Josefa Omer Siddiqui is an assistant professor at Ashoka University. His research is on the French material phenomenologist Michel Henry, as well as on the Urdu poet and philosopher Muhammad Iqbal. He's currently working on a history of the reception of European philosophy by South Asian thinkers like Muhammad Iqbal and B.R. Ambedkar, tentatively titled Subcontinental Philosophy. Over to uh, Dr. Siddiqui. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Glad to see you everyone here and especially those of us uh, and those of you I can't see I'm welcoming those of you as well so today we have professor Tim Beasley Murray as a first you know speaker and his title is going for bust Bolano the broken conference and deep play and he's an associate professor of European culture 
at the university college london and he studied at various places like cambridge paris and he seems to know almost all modern european languages and some ancient european languages as well right so we have a really uh, interesting paper and apparently he's told me before the con before that he that i should keep it as short as possible because he wants to go for bust so <laughs> i i leave it up to professor tim beasley mari Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. And I'll pass it off to Anne to do this. Can I shut this laptop? Thank you. Um, so, first of all, my thanks. Um, thank you, above all, to Amit for um, inviting me here. For organizing this fantastic conference that has been revelatory, has allowed me the excuse for a first trip to India uh, in my life, which is also revelatory, but not simply to have Amit. Particular thanks to Sanchit, who is, is, is the real power behind the throne and has made things so good for, 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 for all of us, for conference participants. Thank you to the fellow speakers who I've enjoyed uh, uh, being in discussion with over the few last few days as we try and work out. And um, what bust means. Thank you to Masefa for keeping your introduction very short, although I hope that you will have many things to say um, afterwards. And thank you to those of you um, who are here in the room today um, and, and also online. Um, my title is um, Going for Bust, Bolaño, the Broken Conference and Deep Play. And if I get my thanks in first, it is um, because I'm sorry to say, I'm pretty certain that I'm going to disappoint you all. There is no way that I can lay claim to the incision, erudition, conceptual sophistication of Andres' paper yesterday, with its analysis of essayism, displacement, the dislocation of translation that defines Latin American bus traditions. There is little hope that I could aspire to Amit's arrogance, his dithering pirouettes, that took us from imagined and real Chile to non-bust busts in Calcutta mansions via a takedown of Renaissance, Italian and Bengali. Certainly I shall fall short of the humor, beauty, po political relevance and sheer exuberance of Pushpala's, Pushpala's mother's India and her bust archive. And doubtless I shall lack the Teutonic rigor and ph philosophical clarity of Leonhardt and his account of the deluded boom of contemporary art with its political pretensions and mauvaise foi and his persuasive call for a punk nihilism or perhaps the bust modesty of an art of the political. No, in contrast to all these things, I shall disappoint you. For as my brother joked, uh, only semi-joking, semi-seriously, when I told him about this conference and his theme, all I really have to do is perform myself. A middle-aged academic, bankrupt of in inspiration, bust, out of energy, out of ideas. And indeed, this is what I intend to do, perform the bust, knowing, as Bolaño urges us, that I will fail in advance. So Bolaño. Uh, the first part of uh, 266, uh, 2666 by Bolaño, the author who's provided the inspiration for, for Amit and for this conference, is curiously all about conferences. And it's all about a literary boom in the making. Titled The Part About the Critics, it tells the story of four scholars, the Frenchman Pelletier, the Spaniard Espinosa, uh, the Italian Melini, and the Englishwoman Norton, and their discovery of an overlooked and mysterious German author, the improbably named Benno von Archimboldi, of whom almost nothing is known, not even his whereabouts, and who may indeed, the novel suggests, turn out to be a serial killer in the Mexican badlands. Gradually, largely thanks to these scholars' activity as uh, Archimboldi translators, uh, uh, article writers and conference organizers, Archimboldi's studies enters what one might term a boom. At a series of conferences, the four critics bring Archimboldi's oeuvre to a wider academic audience, 
resulting in a flurry of scholarly activity, culminating in a further conference uh, called Reflecting the 20th Century, the Work of Benno von Archimboldi. Now, to describe this literary critical jamboree, Bolanyu writes an extraordinary sentence. It's one long sentence, it's 26 lines long, and it's contained within parentheses, right? It's, a, it's this moment of Bolanyan exuberance. And I quote most of it here, okay, and I quote. Espinoza and Pelletier's participa participation in the conference reflecting the 20th century, the work of Benno von Archimboldo, Boldi, was at best null, at worst catatonic. Nor did it go unnoticed by the latest litter of Archimboldians, recent graduates, boys and girls, their do doctorates tucked still warm under their arms, who planned by any means necessary to impose their particular readings of Archimboldi, like missionaries ready to instill faith in God, even if to do so meant signing a pact with the devil, for most were what, what, what you might call rationalists, not in the philosophical sense, but in the pejorative literal sense, denoting people less interested in literature than in literary criticism. Although often incapable of telling their asses from their elbows, and although they noticed a there and not there, an absent presence in the fleeting passage of Pelletier and Espinosa through Bologna, they were incapable of seeing what was really important. Pelletier's and Espinosa's absolute boredom regarding everything said there about Archimboldi, or their negative disregard for the gaze of the others, as if the two were so much cannibal fodder, a disregard lost on the young conference goers, those eager and insatiable cannibals, their 30 something faces bloated with success, their expectations shifting from boredom to madness, their coded stuttering speaking only two words, love me or maybe two words and a phrase, love me, let me love you, though obviously no one understood. We have all been at conferences like the one that Bolaño's narrator describes, populated by eager litters of cannibals, bloated with success, who speak in coded stutterings and seek to persuade themselves as much as the audience that what they say is of importance. Meanwhile, part of us, like Pelletier and Espinosa, drifts off into disregard and boredom. Are you bored now? Are you drifting off into disregard? And if we listen carefully, all that can be heard beneath the drone that threatens never to stop are infantile, libidinous babblings that no one understands. Bolaño's cannibalistic neophyte Archimboldians remain transfixed by the grotesque zeppelin of the literary boom and by the overinflated criticism that accompanies such phenomena. They utterly fail to grasp a Bolaño's conception of literature. Can there be a worse epithet in Bolaño's mouth than to be characterized as being more interested in literary criticism than in literature? The resulting conference and conferences like it, and I would remark, not this one, with their bloatings and flatulent babblings, a phenomena of the boom, noisy and buoyant, but fundamentally meaningless, fundamentally empty, full only of hot air. Reflecting the 20th century, the work of Benno von Archimboldi is one of the last conferences that our four critics attend in Bolaño's novel. In contrast to the cannibalistic Archimboldian neophytes, the four critics, Pelletier, Espinosa, Malini, and Norton, grasp what literature really means. That is, that it means and matters viscerally as much as life and death, for it is life and death. These quartet of critics, a motley bunch of Bolaño heroes, understand what is at stake in literature. Leaving the comfortable university precincts of Europe, overstepping the boundaries of academia, this quartet pursue their chim chimerical object of study, Archimboldi, literally to the ends of the earth, into the dangerous and unbounded territory of the Mexican desert and to the fictional border town of Santa Teresa, a place where literature is in inextricable 
from violence and risk. Unlike the cannibalistic neophyte conference goers who play it safe according to the rules of the academic game, who hedge their bet, these hero critics are prepared to stake all that they have, willing to overplay their hand, willing to go for bust. So now to this conference here, a conference not of the boom, but of the bust and bust traditions. When Amit first shared with me his manifesto, I was, I admit, like many of us, it seems, somewhat perplexed. I found it hard to understand how I might connect my work with the theme of the conference. I've recently finished a manuscript that explores the analogy that holds on the one hand between academic activity literature and on the other hand, play and games. In this book, I argue that as literary critics, as academics in the humanities, too often we are content with what one might call mere game playing. We pretend that what we do is serious, but actually we engage with both literature and life in a sterile form of ludism. In contrast, in the book, I suggest that what we need to do as academics, critics, writers, is to play more, to play more seriously, to allow the games that we play to spill out over the boundaries of the game and onto the more risky territory of real life. Real life. And then I saw it. I saw the connection with Amit in this conference. Playing seriously, transgressing this border between mere game and real life is, to use the analogy of cards and card games, playing for high stakes, overplaying one's hand, playing in such a way that one might go for bust. So in this paper, I will do the following things. Drawing heavily, cannibalistically, I'm sorry to say, on my book manuscript, I will first, I will give an account of a paper that I gave at another conference where unintentionally, to some extent, mm -hmm. I ended up going for bust and possibly broke or bust that conference in so doing. And I want to use this account to think about forms of play and the way in which we as academics, critics and writers might play more seriously, might risk more, might productively go for bust. Forms of what I will call deep play. So now we come to the mise en abîme, to the story within the story, which is my account of the broken conference, which happened about 18 months ago at uh, UCL. You have to, you know, imagine that this is the, if you have a Rahman Geschichte, the outside story, this is the story inside. I arrived at the conference not long after it had started, but I wasn't due to give my paper until the last session of the day. The conference was on the nexus of the creative and the critical. The organist had invited me to contribute, and hence I had been lucky enough not to have had to specify in advance too much detail of what I was going to say. On the morning of the conference, I had by no means finished my paper, but I had a long text that I knew I needed to edit and cut down in length. Nonetheless, I was buoyant and had high hopes. My paper was going to be amusing, metacritical, creative. My paper was going to be my own account of what was one of the most egregiously provocative and problematic conference papers I have ever had the opportunity to witness. So we have got Matryoshka, we've got Russian dolls, okay, or conferences within conferences. You told me that you were editing your paper down the side of the... Uh, not, not right now, that's already happened, but yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I thought that my auto-fictional account of somebody else's conference paper that had, in my view, pushed academic discourse to the limits would in turn, through my own pushing of academic discourse to the limits, be a further witty, provocative, but not unhelpful contribution to a conference that aimed at exploring the boundaries of academic discourse. But combined with these hopes, I had an uneasy feeling, feeling I couldn't put my finger on, a vertiginous sense that what I was going to do entailed risks, 
and it might all end up rather badly. Normally at conferences, I'm reasonably well prepared. As a result, I'm able to take the temperature of the room, take into account speakers and audiences' positions and real-time reactions. Here, I was not properly prepared, and I was not listening, not listening properly to what the other speakers were saying as they gave their papers. Instead, I was editing my text drastically, excising what I intuited might go down the wrong way because context was lacking and trying to add in some context that might better explain. At the same time, half listening, I sensed that there might already be a tension in the air of the conference, possibly gendered between the male and female speakers, possibly about different understandings of the political role of the creative critical. At the lunch break, I confessed to a friend and colleague uh, Nicola, my inchoate premonition that things might go wrong, but she encouraged me to soldier on and to give the paper that I had been intending to give. The clock ticked down all the way to the final session. Let me summarize briefly my paper. It was, as I've already said, a meta paper, which makes this paper a meta meta paper. It was an account, with my own subjectivity foregrounded, of a conference paper given by Marina Gorzinic of the University of Vienna, whom I termed the Slovene art theorist. I sort of sh shrouded her under anonymity. In her paper that I had attended, Gorzinic addressed the migrant crisis, critiquing the policies of Fortress Europe and their consequences in deaths of African and Asian migrants on European shores. She did so in terms such as turbo and necrocapitalism, the buffet of life, terms that were opaque and theoretically convoluted. Moreover, as a means of responding to and combating these horrific realities, both the migrant crisis and necrocapitalism, Gorzinic proposed a form of academic an artistic activism that she illustrated with photographs and pieces of video. These were images of leather-clad activists rubbing themselves up against gravestones and playing with dildos. This she termed porno vandalism. For Gurzinic, porno vandalism is the correct response to necrocapitalism and the exclusion of migrants from fortress Europe. My paper, in turn, explored, perhaps mocked, the disparity between the seriousness of the topic that Gershinich was addressing in her paper and the ludicrous aspect of her approach to making sense of it. Above all, porno vandalism as an academic artistic intervention. I found this disparity morally obscene, and my response to the, this obscenity was the following. I contrasted the ludicrous of Gershinich's paper with the seriousness of her underlying topic, structural violence, European indifference to the deaths of racialized others. My paper, in sum, combined a high degree of playfulness with a high degree of seriousness in a way that, at least at first, I was proud of. As I launched into my paper, Overcoming the vertigo that always accompanies the beginning of a public performance, I felt good. My sentences tripped off my tongue fluently. I enjoyed my turns of phrase and turns of thought. I had a sense that my ideas were landing, making an impact, although, head buried in my text, I couldn't tell exactly what the impact was. I allowed myself to be carried away by crescendi and diminuendi, meaningful accelerandi and rallentandi. But as I reached my final ritardando and coda, I looked up and began to realize that something was wrong. Looking out over the 50 or so people there, I could see consternation on people's faces. And then, to my shock, I saw that at least one person in the audience was in tears. My paper shuddered to a close and the chair invited questions from the floor. The initial silence was fraught, conflictual, uncertain. A first awkward question resulted in an awkward response from the speaker who had given her paper before me. And then the most institutionally significant member of the audience, 
the director of an institute with an important national function in my discipline, stood up and exclaimed, I will not be silenced. And then she walked out, having said no more. The discussion that followed reduced to a discussion about whether we could discuss, and it was decided that we could not. Some sort of conversation eventually did come about with some of the participants later, including incidentally the, the person who was in tears, who was very generous, in a pub off campus. There, whilst I was treated, treated with kindness, I felt stared at, part pariah, part object of pity and prurient curiosity. I had broken the conference and felt somewhat broken. What was it that I had got wrong? What happened certainly confirmed the usefulness of the analogy between what we do in academia and play and games. I had broken the rules. I had acted unfairly. I had committed a foul, probably a series of fouls, and deserved to be penalized by being shown a red card. I had bust the conference because I'd overplayed my hand. I had played too much, had gone for bust. But how? Had I been listening more carefully over the course of the day, I would have realized that a good number of the speakers in the audience were creative critical practitioners who thought of their work, acts that blur the distinction between critical commentary and art, as significant interventions in politically and socially charged struggles. This is sort of what Leonhardt was talking about yesterday. While their positions and creations might not have been quite as extreme and absurd as Gerzhenic and her porno vandalism, they identified with her and understandably felt attacked by my parodic assault on her and her pretensions to seriousness. Their hurt and hostility then rested on a disagreement about the right to play and the right to seriousness and the right to be taken seriously. My paper drew attention to Gerzhenich's full seriousness towards a serious matter and the ridiculousness of porno vandalism as a response to violence and racist exclusion. And it did so through play. But some of the audience objected. I had no right to play, no right to mock Gurzhenich and the seriousness of her artistic academic activism and similar creative critical in interventions by others. By refusing to take her performance of seriousness at its word, I denied her and others like her the right to be taken seriously, while I myself assumed a right to play. Furthermore, as became clear to me, all of this related to gendered and social privilege. These listeners thought that my embrace of play was an exhibition of my privilege, male, white, middle-aged, middle-class, secure in my job at a British pr prestigious university, at the expense of someone whom they thought of as an East European woman. Incidentally, by the way, that's a rather a bit of a cliche when you think about Slovenia. Um, many, most Slovenes would not think of themselves. They would think of themselves as firmly at the heart of, of, of European uh, culture. In sum, the conference broke, I think, over a painfully felt disagreement about rights to seriousness and playfulness. Play is an ambivalent phenomenon, morally and in other ways. And the fact that we often associate it with children by no means guarantees its innocence and does not obscure its power. So for the rest of uh, what I have to say, um, I want to look at three modes of playing, briefly playing at, playing with, and finally what I call play proper, which I'll end up calling deep play. So playing at. Playing at is when we pretend fully consciously that we are not who or what we pretend to be. Here we stand apart, hide ourselves behind masks and dis deny responsibility for our actions. Oh, I was just playing. Playing at of this sort is closely related to power. It assumes that one can mess around with things that other people have to take seriously. The impression that I gave at the conference, I think, was that I was merely playing at being an academic, giving a paper in the humanities, and that I did so from a position of privilege as white, middle-class, middle-aged, male, academic with job security, in a world where others with less of those forms of privilege may have no jobs at all, or whose jobs may be at risk. Playing at means that one can always step out of the game, fall back on one's own serious reality, 
claimed that one was only joking, a form of winning where to walk away unscathed is the prize. This playing out comes at the expense of others. So one reason, as I say, my paper went down badly was the sense that I was playing at, that protected by my coat of privilege, I could assume the right to play and then walk away unscathed. Yes, it was an unpleasant experience. I felt dreadful, confused, guilty, hurt, uncertain, as if I'd managed to upend the entire chessboard with an unintended gesture of gauche violence and was left humiliated and alone amongst the broken pieces. But yes, I walked away, and in some senses, it didn't matter. A step on from playing at is playing with. With this, I mean the sort of playing with, the toying with, that one party forces on another against their will, the cat that toys with a mouse, the psychopathic criminal who toys with his victim, the political and economic class that appears to play and toy with the lives of ordinary people, whether in Downing Street lockdown parties or in the recklessness of financial speculation. These one-sided games are the worst. The person who treats everybody else as their playthings assumes all the freedom of game and none of the responsibility of seriousness. The people who are played with enjoy nothing of this freedom in what for them is no gain and where they are condemned to live with the inescapable consequences. Meanwhile, the person who, play, who plays, like the person who plays at, the person who plays with, can step in and out of the game at will on their own terms, always apart, always set up to win. The very last thing that I insist that I wanted to do at the conference was play with. But there's a third possibility beyond playing at, beyond playing with, what I'm simply going to call play. Serious play, deep play, good play, play proper, play perhaps without any qualifying adjective indeed. What do I mean by this? In Man Playing Games, Robert Caillois distinguishes four basic domains of play that appear as pairings. Uh, Alea, charm, agon, competition, mimicry, and ilinx, vertigo. Um, and I'm going to talk for a moment about ilinx, which is often the, 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 the form of game that is least focused on when uh, people think about Kaiwa. For Kaiwa, ilinx, or vertigo, includes games which are, and I quote, based on the pursuit of vertigo and which consist of an attempt to momentarily destroy the stability of perception and inflict a kind of voluptuous panic upon an otherwise lucid mind, end of quotation. Here he notes it is a question of, and I quote, surrendering to kind of spasm or shock which destroys reality with sovereign brusqueness, end of quotation. The examples that he give include mountain climbing, skiing, fun fairs, helter-skelters, whirling dervishes, and Mexican, Mexican voladores, children swinging and whooping, um, and in what he terms their corrupt manifestations, the intoxications of alcohol and drugs. Illinx may seem a relatively marginal form of play. Still, the differences from other forms of play are important. Illinx, in its purest form, is an activity done entirely for its own sake, where nothing is to be won or lost. Rather, in Illinx, players invest themselves entirely, put themselves fully on the line. They fling themselves down the mountain with the paradoxical purpose of losing, indeed, of losing themselves. Games and play, as Kaiwa recognizes, rarely, if ever, belong to one domain alone. Rather, they contain elements that belong to various domains. An element of Illinx is indispensable to play without a qualifying preposition, deep, serious play. It's there in the late night card game where the world reduces to red and black in a pool of lamplight. And here, by the way, I know the IPL is just about to start up and I was trying to put a cricket metaphor in, but I'm going to use rugby metaphor because rugby is the game that I take seriously. So this may be incomprehensible mm -hmm. to those of you who don't know the game of rugby. It is there in the collective quickening of 100,000 millennium stadium heartbeats in the 80th minute of a Grand Slam deciding rugby match. It is there in the Grand Master hunched over the chessboard, concentrated but lost in thought. All these moments provide an opportunity for a simultaneous focusing and loosening of the self. In play proper, we are fully concentrated and fully distracted. 
in play proper. We are both fully present and fully absent. Present in a way that made, makes alibis impossible. Oh, I was just playing. Absent in a way that makes space for others. Play proper is not myopic. In play proper, we play heads up. Eyes wide open, alive to the other players of the game, making space for them, sensing and anticipating their movements, whether as opponents or members on the same team. And play proper is not narcissistic. In play, we both play proper. We both lose ourselves, escaping ourselves and the mirror and find something of us that the mirror could never tell us, something that was only latently there before. And the result, no one loses, no one wins the humble perfection of play. The piano player whose fingers sweep across the keyboard not subject to conscious control is lost, but never expresses herself to a rap concert hall more in that moment. The one, this is a rugby again. The winger who bursts down the touchline, legs swerving and sidestepping beneath him, finding space between players on the field that seems not to be there, is never more present than in that moment where he loses himself, ghosting past the opposing team. The writer whose prose hurtles out in front of her, tumbling in ludic freedom, taking on a logic that exceeds any design is both, it, it, is both her novel and nowhere to be found in it. Just as we who give ourselves up to reading it can lose ourselves in reverie, but find ourselves in it anew. But in all these cases, at every moment, the possibility of collapse of failure, of going bust is there. Right? Now, at any moment, the fingers could go wrong. At any moment, the winger could, 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 could be taken out. At any moment, right, it could all collapse. It's, it's delicate balance, it's like a spinning toy. What I was aiming to do in that conference, but clearly failed to do, what I'm attempting to do in this one, what I like to think that we should be doing as academics, critics, and writers is playing like this playing with an element of illinx, even at the risk of going for bust. This is, to use another qualifying term, deep play. And here again, the connection with going for bust should be clear. In his notes on the Balinese cockfight, Clifford Gertz draws on a distinction that Bentham makes between shallow and deep play. For Bentham, shallow play is where what is at stake, counters and matches, small amounts of money, is of a magnitude that winning or losing won't make any substantial difference to us. Deep play, by contrast, is where we risk gaining or losing all, where we risk going bust. This is play in Gertz's summary of Bentham, where, and I quote, the stakes are so high that from a utilitarian standpoint, it would be irrational for the player to engage in it at all, end of quote. And since the damage entailed in losing would cause such devastation to the parties to the game, gains of this kind also threaten the good of society as a whole. As a result, Bentham argues that deep play should not merely be considered immoral, but also should be banned by law. Forms of deep play might indeed be extreme cases. And they might, from the point of view of social utility, rightly be considered objectionable. But precisely as Grenzfall, they may tell us something important uh, about games and about their place in life. Deep play can exist in the everyday, albeit at that point where the everyday tips over into the tragic. Thus, one might think of the father in a cliched way, the main breadwinner, who in a moment of crisis liquidates the family's assets and puts them with one last roll of the dice on a 50 to one outsider in the 230 race at Doncaster. Fiction and real life are full of these desperate gambles that threaten total ruin, but bring the glimmer of salvation into sight. Beyond the everyday, however, deep play may take on a more existential aspect. For example, when what is at stake is not simply a livelihood, but life. Games where life itself is at stake can, in turn, take different forms. They can be voluntary. I don't know if you've seen the Korean Netflix series Squid Game, but this is a deadly game show where the participants uh, risk being killed, but they choose to sign up to. Or Russian Roulette, as played by Desperados, where the decision to play is precisely an expression of extreme freedom. They can also be involuntary, as in the Japanese film Battle Royale, 
whose players are kidnapped and dumped on an island, and whereas there is no choice about playing the game of final elimination. Or Russian roulette, as played in the film The Deer Hunter, where captured US soldiers are forced to pick up a revolver and try their luck as part of an external betting game by the Vietnamese captors. And such games may offer substantial awards, rewards, the 20 golden coins that Vukic wins in an early form of Russian roulette in Lermontov's The Fatalist, the unthinkably large amounts of cash that the player's squid game stand to win, honors from a king in the favor of a lady in the case of the medieval knights who risked their lives in the joust, or they may no, offer no rewards at all, simply life itself. In this last category, we find at the voluntary end of things, once again, Russian roulette, played alone as an existential test of will. This is something that Graham Greene recounts in disturbing detail um, uh, in his teenage experiments in a sort of life. What do these forms of deep play tell us? Well, let's go back to the cockfight. For Gertz, what is deep about the Balinese cockfight is not the amount of money and prestige that would be to won and lost, stakes that will be sufficiently high to make the game irrational, immoral, and ideally illegal from a Benthamite point of view. What is deep is the way that the disjuncture between the game and rationality allows the game to make visible an image of Balinese society as a whole in its complex stratifications of gender, status, and so on. This is something, Gatz argues, that it can only do by being merely a game and so much more than a game at the same time. The cockfight enables what Gertz terms the imposition of meaning on life that, and I quote, major end and primary condition of human existence, that access of significance more than compensates for the economic costs involved. The cockfight and its symbolic richness, a process and result of making life visible in its meaningfulness albeit through the displacement of a game that is both life and in another sense, not part of it. Here we may be nearing an understanding of the profundity of play and games, providing they are profound. Play might be a means of imposing meaning on life and through its opaquely symbolic function of enabling us to make sense of life, to see it as a whole, even to make it bearable. Now, and I'm coming to the end, Mosefa, you'll be thankful to hear. How might all this relate to what we do in academia, uh, in the humanities? Let us re recapitulate what is at stake in academia. On the one hand, nothing is at stake. No failure is possible. If my innovative reading of Baudelaire is wrong, whatever that might mean, or fails according to some criteria that would be difficult to determine, what have I lost? Nothing. I have risked and staked nothing. On the other hand, let's just say that I've devoted my life to the study of Baudelaire and the French poetry of the 19th century, as a good number of academics colleagues do, then what I have staked is no more and no less than my life. Let me put it plainly, it is an absurd, irrational, immoral, and possibly to make, be made illegal that dynamic, intelligent, talented women and men should devote their lives to Baudelaire the mind-body relationship, painting techniques of the Italian Renaissance, dialectic in Stillstand, or whatever it might be, when there is so little to be won, and what is to be won is of a, such marginal utility, both individually and socially. The life that we stake in our work, moreover, is not simply our life in the literal sense of our four score years and ten, a working life in the energies we invest in. As academics in the humanities, what we invest in our work is our lives in the sense of our wholeness of human beings. So if we write about Baudelaire, there is nothing important about what we say about Baudelaire. Baudelaire remains unchanged. But what is important is what we say about ourselves, what we find important in Baudelaire. But what, what, we, what, what we say about Baudelaire says about the way that we see the world and how it is meaningful or not, how what we say about Baudelaire speaks to others or not. Thus, in a way that means the consequences of what we do are both far less and far greater than in any other domain of activity, apart from the creative arts that are here analogous, what we risk in writing about Baudelaire is both nothing and everything. When I write about Baudelaire, 
I stand to gain nothing, for there is no real social utility in what I do. But if I fail, I lose everything, because my writing's failure is not external to me. It is my failure as a human being that has given shape to it. This is Russian roulette in the variant played by Graham Greene. It produces and wins nothing, and nonetheless, our lives are at stake. Whatever the case, it seems certain that what we do is deep play, or at least has the potential to be such. And thus, from a Gertzian rather than a Benthamite perspective, what we do in the humanities suddenly looks different. For Gertz indicates that our deep play is not concerned with utility. Rather here, the value of what we do, and I repeat, th uh, through the illusions and distorting mirrors of play, whatever they might be, complex analyses of Baudelarian verse, form and painting techniques in the Renaissance, angel on pinhead meditation on mind and body, cabalistic splutterings on dialectical image, what we might win here is an image of the complexity of life as a whole, an image that might make life meaningful. But this gain is only there to be had if our play is deep enough, if we play seriously, putting our whole lives on the line, risking going for bust. In the words of Bolaño that I shamelessly steal from Andres and his handout yesterday, and I quote, the only experience necessary for writing is the experience of the aesthetic phenomenon, a commitment, or rather a bet, where the artist puts his life on the table, knowing beforehand, moreover, that he is going to come out defeated. The latter is important, knowing that you are going to lose. End of quotation. This is what I've been trying to do in my work generally and today. I'm both sorry and glad to disappoint you. But the wager I have made is that the ball on the roulette table might suddenly jump from the red slot into the black. That my bustness and my performance of disappointment and failure might through some magical serendipitous transformation end up being a win for this conference and for the bus tradition itself. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Tim. I was looking forward to being disappointed and you didn't disappoint. So I think uh, the what you have brought out is the, uh, the immense stakes with which we, you can say, live our lives in the academy. And I think these stakes are not apparent to us, at least to those of us on the outside, that we really risk our entire being on what we write, on what we think. And in many ways, the rewards, as you say, are not even comparable to what we can lose. Right? So I would really like, say, ask uh, people to like, please raise some questions and ask Tim what you might, you can say, be wondering about this talk that he's given and whether he has really disappointed you or not. I think I would also like to know whether he has really succeeded in disappointing you. Or maybe like the Hegelian, you can say, that wizened uh, dwarf that sits within the machine that Walter Benjamin talks about. Maybe you have actually, you can say, transformed this disappointment into some kind of, you can say, victory or some kind of success. So let's see what everyone has to say. Yeah, question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was just thrillingly enjoyable. You know, <laughs> not a single moment of you know bustness, dullness. Uh, I, I I was really intrigued by a, an adjective you used earlier. Um, while talking about Bolano, cannibalistic. And I thought of it in a very strange way, the word cannibalistic connected with what you also said in the end, that sense of staking one's own life, sort of giving away. And, you know, I was thinking initially about cannibalistic, the way we use it in the literary or the academic or the intellectual world. The another word that comes in mind is incestuous, you know, cannibalistic, incestuous, that kind of self-knowing, self-consuming, self-loving culture. But I think it's fascinating that in the end, you gave it a kind of a really affirmative tone that we kind of cannibalize ourselves. You know, this whole sense of the archive out there is not something separate that it is part of our life. I mean, I think it run, runs counter to a whole other tradition of criticism as objective, as scholarship, as detached, and all that scary digital humanity stuff and all that. But I think this, I was really intrigued with whether 
what you said in the end, I think the question is not fully formed in my head, but it kind of does a spin towards like the cannibalistic or the incestuous or kind of kind of cutting part of your own body and giving it away in right. you know right. in in what you're studying. And how does that something so destructive become so enjoyable and so affirmative? I think that's a really interesting point. And I hadn't actually thought you 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 brought to my attention that that metaphor in in in, in Bologna that I think is is an important one. You know, cannibalism is what too many conferences and too many academics do. It's eating other people's work. It's this sort of circular incestuous, if we want to shift the metaphor, you know, use of secondary critics, being more interested in literary criticism than actually in literature, right? You know, this is what we were talking about at breakfast. You know, we should ban students from using secondary literature. We should actually get them to read the real thing rather than cannibalizing other people's mm -hmm. ideas. Like this, uh, this terrible, one. I know cannibal has unfortunate, right? Mm -hmm. The racist context and the way it comes out of the Caribbean and so on. But let's to use the word for a second you know most of our academic life is is cannibalistic and cannibalism of course produces nothing it's sort of just that we're eating each other whereas so a, what you're suggesting is sort of you know i don't think it's the same it's it's being willing to cut off our arms you know i mean balania talks about how how he he left teeth his own teeth around the world as he pursued his dreams, right? Of, 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 of or whatever you, Andres, you will know better. But literally, we we being willing to sacrifice ourselves, you know, but uh, and being willing actually to to take the consequences, and not just this sterile ludism, this sterile circulation of, you know, nothing, which is what the bulk of academic life is like, right? And rather being willing to sort of cut our own arms off. Right? And George Orwell, for example, we think of him as, you know, he's a bit of a sacred uh, cow. So there's a curious metaphor that come up with his son um, in English studies. But, uh, you know, he tattoos himself in Burma, right? I mean, I'm not, not in favor of tattoos and so on. Uh, he, he, he gets but local uh, but Burmese tattoos to sort of show his commitment to not living a respectable life. And they're on his hands, these dots that he puts on his hands. He's like saying, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm offering my body to being to, to what I want to do, right? You know, this he does that when he leaves the Burmese police, the, the colonial police, as a sign that he's he's fully committed. He's risking, he's doing this, making this Balani gesture of putting everything on the line with the possible knowledge in advance one's going to come out defeated, and that's different from cannibalism. Yeah, but it's a really good point. Yeah, Alulika. That was lovely. I don't thank you. I think you succeeded at not disappointing us. So perhaps you failed in a sense. Yeah. Um, I really liked what you said about the three categories you made, uh, playing with, playing at, and deep play, since mm -hmm. two of those are transitive verbs, whereas one of them is a noun. Mm -hmm. You play with something, you play at something, but deep play is, is a concept. Um, I wanted to know, um, my deep play, uh, my deep play include a certain degree of playing with and a certain degree of playing at, or do you imagine each of these, or at least deep play and the other two as distinct from one another? So to speak, if I am in, so if I am engaging in deep play, were I to play with and play at, would I break the rules of deep play? Oh my goodness, that's uh, uh, I, that. Thank you very much, uh, Alolika, for that really interesting question. Um, you know, when Kaiwa talks about, for example the use of masks in shamanism, right? So so the way in which actually mimicry topples over, and I, you know, obviously anthropologically is very out of date, this is from the 60s, but the, 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 this illinx, for example, possess, which is possession by spirits, this sort of vertiginous loss of oneself, starts off as mimicry. First of all, the shaman will put on the mask of the deer, but at some point, right, he will be transformed into it. So there isn't, there isn't a clear opposition, but from a sort of ethical point of view, playing at or playing with is, is allows one to sort of subtract 
right? It allows one to remove oneself from the consequences. Whereas I think if, if we really play or deep play, right, we, 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 we can't walk away unscathed, right? And I think that's the ethical distinction between the two things. But of course, there are elements of playing at, um, maybe not of playing with, in, in what I'm calling deep play, but it's the inability to sort of take off the mask and say, that wasn't me, I was just playing, that I think we, we don't have when we play seriously or we, we engage in deep play. Does that vaguely answer your question? Yeah. Uh, there was a question here. Thank you for an extremely enlightening and very uh... A very exciting presentation. Uh, I, uh, I just had one question a little more prosaic than the earlier ones. Why did you describe your earlier conference, uh, the conference you cited, the example of your uh, presentation there, as having broken with your presentation? Surely in, in a conference, uh, contrasting opinions, contradictory opinions, uh, are opinions which would be enlightening and also enrich the conference. Why do you describe it as broken? Uh, it, it, it actually broke. It, had, it came to an end. It stopped, right? And we had to be abandoned because we couldn't find that do what you're suggesting normally conferences do. I mean, there's a, there's a whole load of context here, and it wasn't just my fault, incidentally, and, you know, whatever. I, the, the, the fuller account is available, right? But the conference actually broke. It's like we were to say, oh, God, what Tim said is so awful. Um, Amit might say, I'm afraid we can't do this. We're just all going to go off and disperse. That was effectively what happened um, in the conference that I described. But isn't that an intellectual breakdown? It, yes, indeed. It was a, a, a breakdown of the ability to discuss because I'd broken some sort of rules. Some of them unwitting, some of them, you know, there were minds I trod on that wasn't my fault, I wasn't aware of tensions and so on, but some of it were to do with a sort of a, dis a, 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 a different conception of what we do in the humanities, as to, as to how we're serious and how we play and what is serious and what is what is what, what, what we can play with. But it, it was a breakdown. It was a serious breakdown. And there were all sorts of ramifications afterwards. My senior colleague and, and this other senior person, uh, who I shan't name, but she's the director of an important institute, we had to have a come to Jesus meeting, as we call it, and, you know, and work out how our institutions would were, 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 were collaborate in the future, et cetera. Yeah, no, no, not good. I mean, yeah, I'm fine. I've got my job. So. There's one more question. This is being on on YouTube, isn't it? I have to be careful about what I say. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That was a very enjoyable uh, presentation. Um, I was wondering, I mean, I, I really like this distinction you were making about playing at, which is a form of distance, of, a, mm. of distancing himself, playing with, which is a form of abuse in a way. Mm. And, and this playing proper or deep playing, uh, where you had a sort of a heuristic side of it, but also you emphasized this kind of relation between loose, I mean, this vertical between loose and loss. I mean, like getting yeah. yourself loose and the possibility of losing it, everything. Um, but I, I also there was a theme of cannibalism that has a different, uh, is a different metaphor in, in South America where it had been used basically in the way we were talking yesterday to actually eat and, and defeat the colonizer. <laughs> and transform him into an, your own power, all this tradition of the Andrade, et cetera. But I would, my, my question had to do with where does the relation with child play uh, engage in all this? Uh, because uh, you mentioned Orwell, I remember this idea of, of the best electric train, I mean, like film, or, or I, uh, I don't know if it was Hitchcock or Orwell, but one of the two. And then um, when you said yesterday, I'm gonna steal one of the quotes, I thought you were thinking of Rivero's quote, uh, which is this one. Uh, this is Rivero speaking about writing and playing. He says, again, I draw the analogy between play and the act of writing and always starting from the observation of my son. Both activities are explorations of one's own personality. And in this sense, journey, fun, surprise, and discovery. I realize that the state of mind that leads him, my son, to his toys is very similar to the one that seats me in front of my typing machine. This satisfaction 
boredom, decide to give the world or to the other or the others in ourselves, in the end to unfold or multiply in the mirror of our fantasy. Yeah. And I thought, uh, so I'm wondering how this, this scheme of play relates to this more basic homoludens uh, that we have and that we are born more instinctively with. Yeah. Uh, the even the Aristotelian idea of child. yeah so so th that's really interesting Andres so in, in the book basically I, I use Homo Ludens a housing of book that some of you may know as a sort of basis and the point there is that play is separate from life right it's a place a special place and a special time you know the the, the rugby pitch and the eighty minutes of the game where some rules of ordinary life are, 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 are suspended so for example in rugby you can throw people violently to the floor but others are imposed like you have to pass the ball backwards and and play is described as being something separate from life and it's that separation that of, of playfulness that engenders that's the sterile ludism of the academy actually that's why this conference is so good it is not just full of his people who come from different play spheres it, it doesn't have that strict boundary around it it's not sort of demarcated now children right importantly don't have that extent that those borders they don't think of play in that housing and right separate space and time thing as benjamin says when the mm -hmm. when the child plays at being a locomotive or an airplane right he really becomes it right there is some that, that, that there's there's a sense that what what children really do when they really play is always deep Right, is always sort of you know transgressive and always doesn't recognize the distinction between right play play and life. So in, in that sense, I think I think maybe we're 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 on the we're on the same wavelength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Sanjit has given the you know permission to say that our games have now ended. So, <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Dr. Beasley Murray, and thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. Uh, from whatever I managed to catch in the beginning, I was wondering if Tim had his way, it would perhaps be called the ninth play or the ninth pretense in the literary activism series. <laughs> but thank you so much. We'll break for tea and be back quickly. Yes. Good, good. Well, I both failed and succeeded, right? It was a, it was, I'd, I'd, I'd loaded the dice, right? Yeah, if I'd failed, fine. I would have won. Yeah, very
the second session of the day uh, by Sara Rai. The presentation is titled Finding a Form, the Fiction of Nayar Masood. The session will be chaired by Professor Shaikat Majumdar, who is a returning chair. He did chair a session yesterday. Uh, Professor Majumdar, a novelist and critic, is Professor of English and Creative Writing at Ashoka University. I invite both Saraji and Professor Majumdar on the dais to take it on from here. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjit, uh, for getting us going and always keeping us on our toes about time because we tend to get sucked into the play and then quickly go bust in time. So I'm glad that is not happening. Uh, I have to say that I'm really happy to chair this session, some of it for very selfish reasons because I found uh, Sarah has been grappling with many of the same questions. I That has kind of intrigued me throughout much of my writing life. And I think at the core of this is how to talk, the question of language and environment, how to talk about life in India when your training is often Western, when there's a Western language in play. And Sarah has dealt with this question between Hindi and English. And I have dealt with the same question with respect to Bengali and English. And I have decided to write in English. She has decided to write in Hindi. But it's, I found that fascinating that many of the questions we've asked are very similar. And um, this, her, her essay on not writing, and that's very, very revealing, especially in the place of a symposium called Bus Tradition, which I've taught in my class. Uh, she brings up this question about how, which is also part of her prize-winning book, Raw Umber, that have really um, very similar questions. You know, how do you write? How do you evoke, evoke a local life, but through a lens of Western craft and English language? Questions which I've been, I think, writers since Raja Rao have been asking. And it's fascinating that even writers who write in Hindi and other local Indian languages have been asking the same questions. Because, you know, I think we live in this continuum between languages and culture. So even when you write in one language, you're not free of the other language. You know, I've found that very much... I write in English, but people have said I write Bangla novels in English. And then in the same thing, in Sarah's case, the question of Western craft and language keeps playing in. So there are a lot of fascinating questions here. She also talks about what it means to be a Hindi writer in North India, a, Hindi, a woman writer. And to what degree you are excluded from things like street conversations, like how easy is it to access it? Like, can you really hear things? I know um, some of us, Tim has been running this great experiment of overhearing conversations at the IIC that, you know, this is fascinating. You sit in breakfast table and things that you hear and there's a whole India, hopefully doesn't go back to England thinking this is the only India that exists. But this is exactly what writers do. We eavesdrop. We are, we love gossip. We, we are more interested in the conversation in the next table than on the table, our, our table. Suddenly everybody's quiet because everybody's trying to listen to the conversation next next door. I tell my workshop students, like, let's just be quiet. Let's listen to the, when I take them out for the dhaba. And this is exactly what Sarah is talking about, that, you know, how do you do that when you're a woman writer, when your access to public spaces is not the same as a man? And these are really fascinating questions, really fascinating questions. It really made me think when I was reading that, that essay and I was discussing it with my students. And also that, you know, that also makes you a very sensitive writer of the private domain, of the domestic space. And I would remember, I think, her father, the writer and critic Sripat Rai, telling her, you can be the Catherine Mansfield in Hindi. And that immediately got my attention, because also because Catherine Mansfield is a writer I greatly admire. I really enjoyed. I've written about her. The evocation on the, on the banality of life is fascinating with Mansfield, the tenderness with which she does it. So there's so many questions which I find so resonant with Sarah's writing, the question she's taught. And I think she really brings it alive. And another book which has really been useful for me, you know, again, in my own reading and writing is Blue is, uh, Blue is, like, Blue is like Blue, that is um, you know, the, the short story collection that she translated. And it's quite fascinating how, you know, there's so many things, you know, um, about craft 
you know, Vinod Kumar Shukla is a writer who wasn't known to the English speaking world for the longest time. But for this translation, I think, you know, we know just the way Nair Masood, another writer whom I think Hindi readers know for the longest time, but I think it wasn't for was Sarah who translated her and gave into prominence. And then Shisha Ghat appeared in the Win Picador book edited by Amit Chaudhary. So I think many of us have come to know, and it's quite amazing. This is exactly what literary activism is about creating an archive, finding new archives, bringing them to a public, and creating new readerships. And fascinatingly, how to talk about craft and the writing process, not as an academic, but as a writer. Reflection, but on writerly terms. Reflection, not as a disembodied process, but reflection as a very internal process, as a cannibalistic process, if I might take, if I might cannibalize Tim's, you know, languages. So I think those questions have been so satisfying to me, so thrilling to me. So I'm really honored to have um, continued this conversation and hear what Sarah has to say about Nair, Nair Masood. Shut this. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Shoykot. I was promised a shock, but I get <laughs> kindness and generosity instead. So what do I do about that? Uh, thank you also, Amit, for asking me to this very August gathering. I mean, even though it's supposed to be bust, but it seems to be full of very interesting and very sort of uh, knowledgeable erudite people. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not so erudite. And uh, well, uh, today I'll be speaking about the Urdu writer Nayar Masood, as Shoykot has already said. Uh, but first of all, I must say that uh, Nayar Masood writes in Urdu, which is also a bust language, because uh, it is increasingly uh, less visible uh, in my hometown of Allahabad, where the road signs used to be in three languages, English, Hindi, and Urdu. I find that the Urdu has now been replaced by Bangla. I love Bangla. My father couldn't move a step without Bangla. I've grown up with Rabindra Shongit, but I do not want Urdu replaced by Bangla. So, uh, and this is a, obviously a political moment. So what does one do about that? Uh, and increasingly the language has been vanishing from our lives as have Muslims been vanishing from our lives as have Muslim writers been vanishing from our lives. So this, I'd like to say that here. And uh, well, uh, this is, with my vague terror of public speaking, which has dogged me into, uh, into my old age, I must say that I'm bust as well. So this is going to be about a bust writer, Nayar Masood, which, I mean, I'll explain why I call him bust. Uh, writing in a bust language and being spoken about by a, another bust writer. So what? how much more bust can you get than that? Than that? So, uh, well, I should start with saying that I've met Nayar Masood. I met him about 20 years ago, some, a very long time ago, on one of his two trips to Delhi, because he came here to collect an award. I, I had nominated him. I did not translate that story, uh, Shoykot. Shisha Ghat was nominated by me. I did not translate it. So he got an award for that story, and he came to Delhi for that. I met him for the first time then. And then, uh, say about five or seven years later, I was foolish enough to think that I could translate him. And... Uh, Harper Collins thought that I might actually be able to do it. So uh, they made up a contract and they said, please go and get it signed and then we can carry on with this project. So I went to uh, Lucknow to Adabistan, which is displayed. Uh, oh, have I shut this and it's gone? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. How do I get it back? Ah, so that's the house. And uh, I'll be tell talking about this house also uh, in my uh, little essay that I've written on him. So this is where I visited him. He was already uh, quite old and quite sick. And when I uh, told him about this translation and I showed him the contract, uh, he said, you just fill up whatever you like, I'll sign it. So I said, okay, I mean, but obviously that didn't get signed, didn't get written, the, I didn't translate it, so the book never happened. So, but that's how I met him for the second time. And, uh, and I've been fascinated with his work for a very long time. So I'm glad, uh, Amit, that I've been given this chance to speak about him. So I think I'll just get into it right away. And uh, I hope, I mean, I can just read it. So, so um, it's called, 
uh, finding a form, the fiction of Nayar Masood. Uh, well, uh, reading the st uh, stories of the Urdu writer Nayar Masood, one soon begins to feel a certain disquiet. The places described in them, narrow dark passageways and half open doors, twisting by lanes, courtyards with their arches and niches, empty rooms filled with shadows, dusty trees overhanging unused wells, all seem very familiar. You've seen them somewhere. I've got the wrong glasses on, sorry. Yeah, so they all seem very familiar. You've seen them somewhere. They lie just at the edge of your consciousness. You try to remember, but they evade memory. The people seem familiar too, mysterious visitors who soundlessly appear one day in the house next door without being seen coming, with their half smiles and silent movements. You know them. The feeling of being unsettled deepens when you begin to suspect that the world of the stories uncannily reflects the one that is already inside you. It's as if someone were quietly showing you scenes from your own mind. It is disorienting, for notwithstanding the intimacy that the reader feels with the story, stories, there's that odd sensation of not being able to place them. Something is askew. Always in sight, yet always elusive, the stories are like mirages. They shimmer and seduce, leading the reader into a maze where you go round in circles, searching for meaning, but the text carries no familiar pegs of causality. The logical sequence of beginning, middle, and end are missing. The elliptical, fragmentary structure of the narrative blurs the line between the real and the imagined. The stories seem to have no purpose. They are just simply, quietly there. Muhammad Umar Memon, Masood's translator, has called them stories that are preoccupied with being rather than with meaning. It is this quality of the stories that led Shamsul Rahman Faruqi, the astute Urdu uh, critic, novelist, and closest friend of Nayar Masood, to say about them that they go nowhere, they are like dreams, clear as glass, yet profoundly mysterious. The stories create subliminal connections with the reader that are as difficult to put a finger on as the stories themselves. They are to be read with the senses, and it is at a sensory level that they can be understood. Though understood is not the word that comes to mind when talking about Nayar Masood. The stories are experienced at a level that is not quite cerebral. Nayar Masood was born in Lucknow in 1936 and till his death in 2017, continued to live in Adabistan, which means the home of literature. And you can see it written on that, I mean, it's in Urdu, the name is written on top of the house. So it's, uh, this was a haveli that was bought by his father, Sayyid Masood Hassan Rizvi Adib in Turiya Ganj or Victoria Ganj in the old city. His father had the old Haveli redesigned by the formerly untrained but imaginative architect, Aga Mir Hussain. Masood has a detailed description of the house in his essay called Adabistan, published in the Karachi-based journal, Aaj, about how, as a boy, he watched the structure take shape, a whitewashed house with balconies and balustrades, rather a Gothic-inspired fantasy with arches and swirls in the shape of crescent moons, towers on either side of the facade, and pillars on which rest round concrete blocks. This is the house Masood lived in all his life. He rarely left Lucknow, disliked travel and social chit chat. He found himself completely unable to write outside Adabistan. This is the only place I can write, he said. I have never written anything outside of my home, and the house crops up frequently in his stories with its neem trees, its courtyard, and its dark interiors. I must say here that when I was trying to search for his uh, stories, for his collections, I could find them nowhere. The Urdu versions were just nowhere around to, to be bought or 
borrowed or whatever. So, and he didn't have them either. He didn't possess a single copy of his books. So it was his son uh, who was around at the time and for somehow he had photocopies and he gave them those photocopies, which I still have to this day. And that's the only Masood I have. Now I've acquired some other collections as well. And of course, now he's widely available in English and in other languages, Spanish, I think, also, and uh, Swedish and some other languages. He's been translated now into many languages. So at that point, there was nothing. So, well, unconcerned with plot and linear development, Masood's fictions go in search of their form. They do not quite fall in the genre of the conventional story. Or one might say, the extent, they extend the boundaries of the form. By his own admission, he never felt the restlessness to write that comes upon most writers, and it took him several months to finish a story. He'd write the first sentence to be followed by the second only after 20 days had gone by, nor did he have a daily routine of writing. Itre Kafur, his favorite, took him a year to write. Nayar Masood published four collections of short stories titled Simia, which means the occult, in 1984, Itre Kafur, which is Essence of Camphor, 1990, Taus Chaman Ki Mena, the Mena from Peacock Garden, 1998, and Ganjefa, Card Game. He also translated Kafka, with whom he has an affinity, perhaps because, like Kafka, in the density of his prose, he has an inclination to opacity, though each sentence is clear as glass. He had not read Kafka when he started writing stories, he said in an interview, but Kafka and Poe were writers he thought he could learn from. Masood's Kafka translations appeared in 1978 in the collection Kafka Ke Afsane, and his translation from Persian to Urdu of Mirza Fateh Ali's Hakim Nabatat in 1967, followed by the collection Farsi Kahania in 2002. Masood's parents belonged to families of Hakims, practitioners of Yunani medicine, but his father left the family occupation to become an Urdu and Persian scholar with a considerable library of academic books. Unsurprisingly, there were no books for children. Nayar read whatever he could lay his hands on. By the age of five, he says, he had read the canonical work of Urdu literary historiography, Abe Hayat, by Muhammad Hussain Azad and his darbar e akbari about the achievements of Mughal Emperor Akbar by the time he was 10. He had written a few early stories, but later devoted himself to research in Urdu and Persian, in both of which he acquired a PhD. He taught Persian at Lucknow University from 1967 till he retired in 1996. In addition to fiction, he published in 1973 a treatise on Ghalib with the title Tabir e Ghalib, and in 2011, a biography of Miranis, the master of Marcia or elegiac poem, who was born in Lucknow. Masood resumed writing relatively late in life. He wrote to Maimon, his translator at the University of Wisconsin, that he was interested in calligraphy, painting, and music, and that he could also manage minor repair jobs around the house, which have to do with plumbing, masonry, electrical work, and carpentry. But I did learn the art of book binding formally, he says. My true occupation at any rate is reading and occasionally writing. Despite the reference to occasionally writing, he wrote at least 33 stories and his knowledge of masonry, carpentry, and bookbinding informs some of them. In Essence of Camphor, the narrator, who incidentally seems to be the same in most of the stories and is perhaps the author himself, is seen practicing the difficult art of perfume making. Camphor is the basic ingredient of all the perfumes, but even a vivid description of the process by which the perfume is made does not bring the reader any clarity about it. There could be a parallel here with Masood's subtle art of telling a story. This is how, in Muazzam Sheikh and Elizabeth Bell's translation, he describes the process of making perfume using an extract of camphor as a base. Start quote. In my extract, however, one does not smell camphor or any other fragrance. 
It is a colorless solution inside a white square-bottomed china jar, no fragrance of any kind, wafted through the jar's narrow opening when the round lid is removed. Attempting to smell it, one feels a vacant forlornness, and the next time round, breathing it in more deeply, one detects something in that forlornness. At least that's what I feel. I cannot say what others feel since no one has ever smelt that extract in its purest form apart from me. It is true that when I prepare an essence with this foundation, those who inhale it think there is something else underneath the expected fragrance. Obviously, they cannot recognize it, for there is no fragrance at all in my extract of camphor. End quote. The perfume is essentially indefinable. It denies the expectation of something underneath the camphor fragrance. And one who smells it feels only a vacant forlornness. If a parallel may be drawn between perfume making and writing fiction, one notices that Masood's stories too belie the expectation of a resolution at the end. He said that he disliked dramatic endings and had edited out the last sentences, last sentence in many stories, if they seem to have too forceful an ending. One might recall Bolaño, a self-proclaimed bus writer, whose stories for their indefinite endings have been referred to as being governed by a poetics of inconclusiveness. It could be added that Bolaño's stories have a conclusive inconclusiveness. The narrative is often simply cut short. Masood's stories too do not have definite endings. Rather, they fade away, vanishing like a wisp of smoke, or in fact, like the extract of camphor that wafts away from the jar in which the perfume is being made. Leaving a vacant forlornness, this vacant forlornness can be taken as the invisible center of the story, if one can be so reckless as to assign it a center. Essence of Camphor is about the friend friendship of the narrator with Mahrukh Sultan, a girl with an unnamed medical condition, who one day moves into the neighboring house with her family. But it is also about making things, about creating. And from the opening scene with the narrator making perfume, the story quickly goes off at a tangent to reveal that he has been fond of making sundry items out of ill-assorted pieces of things picked up here and there, that he stores under his bed, quote, pieces of wood, snippets of gaily colored cloth, scraps of tin, metal wire, even fruit pits. For much of the story, he is taken with the idea of making what he calls a kafuri sparrow, perhaps because the white bird and its scent remind him of camphor. It is camphor that forms the tenuous link between perfume making and the making of the bird which then transforms into a real bird, and the bird leads to a tree. As in dreams, one object changes into another. Sounds transform too. What the narrator thinks is a fluttering of the bird's wings in the tree becomes the sound of quiet rain. This is how Masood describes the scene with the tree and the bird that the narrator sees. Now, quote again. It was metamorphosing before my eyes. The raindrops were tracing green lines on the fuzzy leaves as they washed away the dust, and the wilted leaves were slowly regaining their freshness. Suddenly the rain began to fall more heavily, and I turned toward the door in the wall. The faint smell of earth rose to my nostrils. Then the sound of a rapid fluttering met my ears. I turned again to look back at the tree. The bird was fluttering about in a fixed spot just above it. As its swiftly flapping wings scattered fat drops of water, the bird appeared as if enveloped in a white fog. On all sides of this trembling tuft of fog, the incessant rain grew white strings from sky to earth. This is a sensory experience in which eyes, ears, and nose are simultaneously involved. And the narrator's experience is similarly registered by the reader. It seems possible to touch the wilted leaves and feel the trembling tuft of fog. The smell of camphor pursues the narrator throughout the story and the forsaken fragrance is there again, right at the end, when Mahrukh Sultan dies 
and the narrator feels an immense forlornness. The forlorn forlornness also manifests in a feeling of absence, a sense of something missing, which is happening beneath the surface. This comes about because of the author's technique of leaving out large parts of the narrative, even after the whole thing has been worked out in great detail. The page becomes a palimpsest in which the unwritten or what has been written and then erased is perceptible to the reader. There is a deliberate nurturing of absence by the excision of sizable chunks of the narrative and the withholding of clarity as a literary device. In, a, in an interview, Masood has said, what if one constructed the whole story but didn't narrate the whole of it? Not even, a, not even hint at some of it. Would it carry over to the reader's mind, however dimly? I soon realized that this was possible, end of quote. His world, replete with trees, birds, and details of houses with the objects in them. There are insignias and sacred stones, ancient heirlooms with unclear histories that are handed down in families. All seem to belong not to this world, but to a parallel one that exists alongside. The straightforwardness of his prose could tempt imitation, but the simplicity of the text is deceptive. No one can be like him. He is, as Mehman says, sui generis. His is an absent tradition, one might say. So intent is he on erasing identifiable markers. Like Kafka, he listens, not to tradition, but to language. His ears keening to hear the extraneous word, the unnecessary punctuation mark that can break the back of a sentence. He reads the work of other writers for their shortcomings rather than their strengths to learn how not to write. Prose, he has said, has a power of its own which can be written into it. You just have to work hard at it and be attentive. So what is it that he pays attention to? To what does he listen? I've tried not to write a single obscure sentence, he says, and makes it, makes it clear that he stays away both from metaphors and from idioms. He writes with simplicity and directness, and it is by listening to language that the clarity of his prose is achieved. Yet, the clarity itself is misleading. His world is meticulous in its detail, but the details don't sharpen the images, they blur them instead. There appears to be a pact between specificity and haziness, and this lies at the heart of the stories. There is a tension between what is seen and what is felt to be present, even when it is not seen, and the tension is never resolved. The stories have no closure. Most of them are set in what feels like a familiar local kasbah, but nowhere is the location of this unnamed settlement mentioned. Since Masood lived in Lucknow, the inference can be drawn that this is where the stories are set. There is also above doorways, the telltale motif of twin fish, the royal insignia of Awadh. But apart from one or two exceptions where Lucknow is mentioned, the story Ganjefa comes to mind. There is a haziness about the locale that goes against the grain of precision in the prose. Only after a few readings does one realize that these settings exist nowhere except in the hermetic space of the writer's mind. The bazaars and the gateways, the wells, arches and columns, the crumbling stone facades of school buildings and shops that populate Masood's stories come from his past, and it is the past that fuels his fiction giving to it its melancholy aura. Arches affect me personally, he says. I find them very evocative. The mere sight of an arch touches off a whole train of thought in me. I won't call it a symbol. An arch is not a symbol of anything, nothing at all. But it never fails to exert a hypnotic pull. Countless stories lurk in an arch. And so they do, end of quote. There are bunches of faceless, faceless relatives and neighbors who speak indistinctly or in whispers. Sounds are often muffled, making it hard for the narrator to hear. The speech inaudible in the story reaches the reader. 
you make the vaguest suggest suggestion, Masood has said, and the reader's imagination takes over. The first story that he published, Nusrat, was written in 1971 when he returned to fiction after spending five or six years writing his PhD thesis in Persian. Too diffident to send the story in his own name to Shabkhun. And here again, this is the bus tradition working. Uh, too diffident to send the story in his own name to Shabkhun, the journal edited by Shamsul Rahman Faruqi, he passed it off as his translation of a Persian story. The name he sent it under was Roya Nasij, which in Persian means fabric woven in dreams. And in fact, the story was a complete and coherent dream that he had written down. Later translated by Maimon as the woman in black, it is dreamlike, featuring a bad woman, bad woman, who is never named, and in a, in a separate thread of action, there is Nusrat, one of the few characters in his fiction that do have a name. The narrator finds her sitting under a tree while she waits for an, for an old surgeon to attend to her feet that have been crushed in an accident. With the inexplicability of dreams, her feet get cured with no scars remaining and then are again misshapen at the end of the story. A kind of oblique, tormented eroticism pervades the narrator's interaction with her. This, in Maimon's translation, is the last glimpse, somehow visually reminiscent, of a painting by Gustav Klimt that the narrator gets of her. Quote, start quote. My eyes fell on her. Her features were not visible. I couldn't understand why this was so. I leaned forward and took a closer look. Dry yellow leaves covered her face like a veil. I wanted to remove the leaves from her face, but saw that they were held together by cobwebs and my hand stopped halfway." End of quote. It is a distinctive, slightly out of focus perspective, a slanting angle from which the writer approaches old houses and the people that live in them, mysterious families whom the narrator often does not know. In Tehvil, which means transference, uh, there is a shop resembling the usual corner shop. And this shop is always run by one Noros who is succeeded by others of the same name as if it were a royal title. The current Noros always goes mad and he is replaced by another Noros who, all, who takes charge of the shop till he too goes mad. And the next Noros who will eventually also go mad takes his place. Two little girls materialize from nowhere in the shop. They look exactly the same, have strange eyes, and there is something eerie about the way they move and try to speak. The weirdest of situations are presented in completely unembellished language with no exclamation marks or other signifiers. All of this adds, adds up to create a sense of disjunction. The familiar is stripped of familiarity. In Essence of Camphor, there's something odd about the family, uh, neighbors of the narrator, described in utterly plain language in Sheikh and Bell's translation. They move in into the house and the quote goes, there were six or seven people who had sat for the most part in silence with their heads bowed. The women of the house would get up to do some work, then return to their place and sit with their heads down. The men would return from the work, go quietly to, to their rooms, re-emerge after changing their clothes and sit with their heads down. A girl would ask another something, be answered, and then both would fall silent and lower their heads. All of them seemed to be engulfed in a fog. The description has the visual quality of a dream seen through a fog that renders the characters barely visible. In other stories too, the characters move slowly through indistinct landscapes, and the scenes in their silent, slow austerity recall the cinematic frames from a three, Theo Angelo Paolo's film. He, he's a prominent exponent of slow film. So they, they recall that. On the shifting sands of the Masoodian world, time too is a slippery entity. Ojhal, which means invisible, translated as obscure domains of fear and desire, by M.U. Maimon opens with the sentence, we kept looking at each other for, a, for the longest time ever. We are not told who these characters are or how long was the longest time ever. But the story that begins with an amorous encounter moves on 
with the narrator taking up the singular profession of inspecting houses. Soon he is experienced enough to tell just by looking at a house, not only how old it is, but also the speed with which time has passed in it. In fact, time passes at a speed different inside a house from the speed outside it. And it also changes from one house to the next. It seems to run at a faster pace in the bazaar. There is a constant compression and expansion of time. In this refusal to stick to the realistic notion of time, Masood is perhaps creatively assimilating elements of the dastan, which is the oldest form of storytelling in Urdu. Action unfolds in all sorts of ways in the dastan. The supernatural and the mystical are its ingredients, as are the fable, folklore, magic, and alchemy. There is little regard for the boundaries of what is possible, logical, or real. In his lecture on exactitude in literature, in six memos for the next millennium, Calvino speaks about the passion of the 19th century poet Giacomo Leopardi for savoring the beauty of the vague and indefinite. Citing a passage by Leopardi, Calvino enumerates the conditions that must, must exist before one can do this. What he requires, now this is a quote, what he requires is a highly exact and meticulous attention to the composition of each image, to the minute definition of details, to the choice of objects, to the lighting and the atmosphere, all in order to attain the desired degree of vagueness. Quote end. This holds true for Masood, who pays close attention to minutiae in building up a scene. The observation of detail adds up to a visual emphasis in the stories, but this is an illusion that is quickly destroyed. After laying out a scene in particular detail, a haze is deliberately created to undermine that depiction. So he's kind of canceling out as he goes forward, he cancels out what he's just written. The things seen in the murky light turn into something quite different on sustained looking. In Nudva, which means lamentation, there are far-flung lands where the, where the wastelanders live. The narrator has spent his life in fruitless diversions. This is a fruitless is in commerce. And one of these is to wander about, visiting small and scattered communities that are slowly dying out. In what, one such community, he becomes acquainted with their ritual of congregational lament at the deaths that seem to happen rather frequently. People from these wasteland communities visit him when he's back home. Nearby shopkeepers point him to where they are, the people who have come. So now this is a quote. Without saying a word, they pointed at the nameless dirt path which sloped down towards the north, its mouth nearly blocked off by the bazaar's encroaching garbage dump. I looked where they pointed. At first glance, it appeared as though the area beyond the dump was dotted all over with small garbage heaps. But a second glance revealed them to be a group of people who sat crouching on the ground. The, now, end quote. The transformation of garbage heaps into people is possible only because of, vagueness, of the vagueness carefully cultivated by Masood. Quite apart from the dusky light that pervades the description of scenes, there are other impediments to sight. People are engulfed in fog, but sometimes it is raining and water fills the eyes, preventing seeing. Water is also replaced by sand, as in Sultan Muzaffar's chronicler of events. Even a group of laughing and shouting girls is, is described in Essence of Camphor as a darkness of many colors that fills the room. There is a further blurring of perspective in the same story, and the narrator's house seems at once too close and too far. How does one approach a writer who conceals, withholds, erases, mystifies, and misleads, yet writes with something like mathematical precision, and what can be called visual poetry. Paradoxically, the stories are set in what seems to be an eternal past, and yet they never do become the past. It's as if everything remains in abeyance, it doesn't pass. No closure is possible in the illusory nature of things. Everything that has existed will always exist. Nothing fades away, nothing dies, says Angelo Paulos. 
the maze of Masood's world then is entered for its own sake. The reader breathes in the rarefied camphor scented air and emerges feeling replenished. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I, I do feel like I have the sensation of waking from some kind of a dream while I listen to it. And I, I have this desperate need to smell camphor. Uh, and of course, as you said, it's it's something which doesn't have a smell. I mean, camphor does have a smell, but the way it's described here, it's almost that smelllessness. And that longing tells me how much I got into your talk as well as Masood's stories through through it. And um, that expression, forlorn, the forlorn is such a lovely word. I mean, I, I was reminded it's such a beautiful word. It sort of curls against itself. And that expression, vacant forlornness, it's such a beautiful phrase. And, um, you know, I think it really, I, I, I wanted to say that camphor is kind of a metaphor for this fiction, but I don't think it's a metaphor. It's actually the fiction. It is part of it. It's continuous with it. Metaphor implies a kind of a imagination of things, but it's so much viscerally in the story that I was really immersed in it. Uh, even when you said things like settings, the settings it talks about don't actually exist. So there's this kind of curious, I could quite see why the Kafka, Kafka is the existential, not that sense of, you know, and that description, I think it was by um, Baruki that it's clear as glass and yet profoundly mysterious, that oxymoron clearly came alive, that it's really clear physically and at the same time profoundly mysterious. There's so many things that really struck me, his evocation of arches. I think that is what a writerly imagination is really about, that to be struck by the physical and yet the physical not necessarily be symbolic of anything. Can some can you be really struck by something and it just stay there? Arches are just evocative, but they don't evoke anything, but they just sort of strike me. So there's so much going on, you know, how, you know, all the fact that he reads others to see their flaws. That's a fantastic, really innovative way of reading. How, what not to do. So this celebration of negativity is so beautifully brought out, I think, in his fiction, as well as you know, in your evocation of his writing. So I was really delighted. So I'll, I'm sure people have things to say. It's not going to be, you know, nothing, but I'd love to hear your intervention since it's nothingness. So, questions? Yeah, I think so, I wanted to. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, I was thinking about this, uh, you know, pact between haziness and specificity that you talked about. And uh, in in that regard, uh, I was thinking how this pact uh, is always in some ways involved when you are writing about the familiar. And uh, I was also thinking since you have also worked on Vinod Kumar Shukla and uh, other writers, for instance, who come from this uh, what we might call bus traditions. I'm thinking of Arun Kolatkar. I'm also thinking here of Amit, who is sitting here, where uh, this pact of specificity and haziness, where sometimes specificity is sought after doggedly, but it always gives out this aesthetic which produces uh, wonder, which doesn't produce clarity. But always, as Shoykot was talking about, this sense where, you know, the 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 image doesn't or the writing doesn't take you to some symbolic meaning it it just leaves you with this feeling which doesn't make sense to you at all so i was sorry for that you know complex question but what i'm trying to ask is uh, if you have thought of masood's uh, work in some ways also in relationship to vinod kumar shukla and and this idea of of the bust writer so yeah Oh, well, uh, one similarity I think that Masood and uh, Shukla share, and as do other writers in Hindi and Urdu, uh, is that, uh, well, very few people read them. They belong automatically to the bus tradition. This I can say of uh, the languages in India, because most of the people do not know about them. I mean, the, uh, quite a few of them are not translated, really. So this is part of an argument that... Uh, uh, Amit also presents in the state, uh, mission statement of this uh, uh, seminar. So uh, basically, uh, writers in uh, the languages are bust writers, by definition, I think. 
and uh, Shukla and Masood also because they are both quite extraordinary in their own ways. There's no similarity as such between the two writers because Masood's world is uh, a kind of sort of uh, world that he has arrived at by imagining it and observing the details around him. Whereas in Shukla, uh, the world is extraordinary. The world that he sees around him is extraordinary. I mean, it's just everyday things that he's looking at, everyday events that he's uh, coming upon, and very small things. It takes nothing to make a story, really, for him. And uh, for instance, when he, uh, the title of his books are also quite interesting in that, that res uh, respect. Like one of them is called Khile Gatu Dekhenge, which when it flowers, we will see when it flowers. So it's basically he's observing things and he's not trying to go after any theme as such. He's not writing about anything. He's waiting for the process to come upon him and he will see what happens at the end of it. So uh, that way, I suppose uh, that could be a very distant kind of similarity with Masood, but otherwise their worlds are totally uh, different, worlds apart, I would say. So does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was uh, wonderful to hear. The image you put up there is also so beautiful and evocative. I was, the word that kept coming back to my mind, and in fact has been there in my mind ever since I have read Masood and in, admired him, is the word magic. And I was wondering whether, since we're talking about boom and bust, we have been talking about it since yesterday, whether we could coin a phrase magical realism to contrast with the, which is of the bust tradition, to contrast with the magic realism of the boom. Because there is something magical in the realism, the everyday, you've been saying this again and again throughout your paper, you said it in response to the last question, the ordinary, the everyday, the detail, uh, the, the, the manner in which, but when you read, I mean, for, for me, when I first read Masood, it is, there is something magical it's like the magical mystery tour. It is mysterious as well, of course. Uh, um, it is. It it is a, a form of realism. It, it is. It, it is a form of realism. This is a sort of magical realism, in contrast to the almost the violence of magic realism, where a snake turns into. A, you know, Andres gave us uh, uh, many examples yesterday from uh, one hundred uh, years of solitude. Um, I'm. I'm not sure. There's a question there. It's just that I wanted you to spec. Well, you already have, but to speculate further on. Yes, you've spoken about the 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 manner in which he brings these details into the stories to create this blurring of vision, which transforms into sort of dreamlike situations. But whether whether we could actually describe this describe it as a realism that is that is magical and mysterious at the same time. It, just thoughts in relation to the bust and boom that well, we've been talking about since yesterday. Well, he so himself would not have uh, called himself magical. I mean, he was so uh, the, re uh, the yeah, realism he kind of for us liked these words for magical, and you know, all, he was very uh, sort of he just devoted to the word, the uh, you know, the meticulous noting down of things and words. And partly, I think this impression of magical, uh, you know, the magic in his stories could also be because the terrain is so unfamiliar. I mean, we don't know what happens. You know, if you go to, in fact, when I go sometimes to a very kind of poor Muslim neighborhood, you often see those things. You see those crowded uh, sort of lanes, you see narrow sort of openings, you see half open doors, all those things are there. They are wells quite often, which are sort of trees hanging over them. So these are things that you have seen so uh, the the reality that he writes down is that reality, and which may be unfamiliar to a lot of us, maybe. So half of that, I think, is the magic from from his writing comes from that. Maybe. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I, I guess I'm going to repeat what others have said. And uh, I think by magic, maybe she means a kind of hypnosis, but a hyp hy uh, the hypnosis created yes. by, by 
but not by not magic as the the Latin American magic yes. realists uh, yes. um, sort of introduced an element of the obviously miraculous yes. to 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 the text. Where here there's nothing obvious. There's no obviously miraculous transformation. You we are being hypnotized by by the real. Uh, I I just want to say a little bit about Nair Masood. I mean, uh, and then ask you a question yeah. about my sort of own. Uh, uh, discover, just indulging myself over here, really, maybe taking advantage of the fact that I org organized the symposium. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, when uh, this publisher called the New Press from uh, from New York, what, what, it used to be one of the best independent publishers in America. Published, I think, it was a collection called Essence of Camphor. Um, okay. So, so the they, I, I presume they published a selected stories with the title Essence of Camphor. And that was his first sort of appearance in English. And uh, they sent me the book for a blurb. Uh, and so I've been looking for that blurb. Um, and I see that they've only quoted the most banal bit of it, uh, the most extraordinary fictional voice to have emerged in world uh, literature this decade. No, there's this another one that is uh, your quote, which is used very often. Uh, I think it's been used by Mehman also, calm and passionate. Yes, and that's what strength. that's the one I wanted to get to. Yeah. Uh, so this, I I, I mean, they've, they use the whole quote in the book, but here in the website, it's only this bit. No, it's only that. Uh, it's only that mm -hmm. bit. I was looking for it while listening to mm -hmm. you. I hope you didn't think I was WhatsApping or anything else. <laughs> no, no, I, was, no, I, was, no. I was looking for this. So, um, and and uh, at that I was saying that I think because you know, that was a year of Booker Prizes and Indi Indian yeah. wins, etc. All of that was part of the celebration. Mm -hmm. And here I received this book. I didn't know about this person and immediately struck uh, by by this writer mm -hmm. and, and what he was doing. And that, that came, uh, brought, made me call him in the, for, um, for the same endorsement, a passionate but calm realist yeah. of the strange. A passionate but calm realist of the strange. So bringing... Uh, 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 using words which which you also have come to arrived at with with in your essay for having read Masood, I suppose one one cannot but um, address the strange from a form of realism yes. that he's up to. Um, what what I would uh, what I'm wondering is the calm. I, I noticed the calm. Uh, what would be the provenance uh, of this calm in 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 terms of an intellectual or artistic provenance, or even a spiritual provenance, and I'm just wondering about about this quality of calm. And then to repeat the first question uh, about Vinod Kumar Shukla, uh, not so much the stories, but the poems, which are now coming out from yes. literary activism. Uh, again, endorsements, three endorsements, including mine, have somehow come up with the word mathematical. You know, because the poems, again, are absolutely bizarre and absolutely logical. It's all, it's all not, it's just not the lo logic we, with which we work from moment to moment every day. But otherwise, it is completely logical. Uh, there is a mathematical logic and realism going on in Shukla's poems in this, uh, mm -hmm. in the book, uh, in the poems in the book that's going to come out. And Nirmal Verma. Uh, the European stories, where there is no mention, I think, mostly of Europe uh, and their calmness and their realism. A, a realism, again, which depends upon not mentioning what a realist would usually mention. That is, I'm in Europe, I'm in Prague, or I'm here or there. None of that is mentioned. It augments a certain idea of realism, uh, which, which we are unaccustomed with. Um, again, I'm wondering about how these writers in poetry or in fiction come to this poise, not even poise, calm really, this state of calm, and then arrive at a, re at a realism which uh, withdraws all, the, withholds all the information that realism gives us. Um, and also, the last thing I would say is thereby also kind of um, inverts the idea of a writing of, of, of exile and a writing that's local. These, which I think are to many writers secretly banal ideas and necessary academic categories maybe, or critical categories. Um, and, and there was a quote in that handout where Bolaño, I think, is saying that, you know, I don't believe in exile. Even at home, you're at exile. Yes. Completely, yes. I've written an 
essay about this in, in the way that this happens. Uh, here is a man who lives at home. Now you've shown us the picture of the home. Uh, completely inverts, as does Nirmal Verma, this idea of write, writing about home or exile. You know, it's not as if Masood was a writer who wrote about his home, his hometown, his home place. Uh, it's not as if Nirmal Verma is saying, I'm a writer in exile. In the way that that would usually happen. That would usually happen by saying that I was in Prague and out of sorts. That's not what they're getting at. No, actually with uh, Nirmal Verma, I think uh, they are uh, pointers to where he is. He may not mention that I'm in Prague, but I mean, they are pointers that tell you. I mean, they're very telltale sort of giveaways uh, about uh, the place that he's uh, at the, it's at odd the, that he doesn't then dwell on them in any he way. He doesn't dwell on them in any case. I mean, he's just, they come as sort of, uh, by the way, kind of thing when he's writing and, you know, it just uh, slips in uh, the location. I mean, you sort of infer from the what he's written about the location and he doesn't actually mention the places. Nor does Masood, as I said. I mean, he, we don't know whether he's writing about Lucknow. The places are never named except in a couple of stories like Ganjifa is uh, actually, he does mention Lucknow. And there are a couple of other stories where he mentions Lucknow. And uh, as to the calm that you uh, ask about, I think it's it's the writer's space inside the head. You know, they are uh, they are both like Masood and you know uh, Kumar Shukla. They never travel, hardly ever travel. They live in one place. They live in the same locale. They see the same things happening day out, day in and day out. So they are they are they are kind of very poised, very self possessed in the location that they are in. And the location is often also in the mind, only in the mind. So they, uh, which is why they get that unhurried feel to the writing also, because the writing sort of very meticulously writing, quietly writing slowly, they are not bothered with. It also it sort of leads to the question of why do we write? Why do we write? I mean, I don't think I can answer that question. It's just something that one does. You wake up one day and you want to write. I mean, it's just, you can't live without it. It's like breathing, you know? So it's that kind of feeling that you get from these writers uh, who are not doing it to be known or who are not, you know, it's just an activity like a cricket would sort of produces that sound from its legs. It's that kind of thing, you know? It's just that you can't live without it. So you're doing it, so you're writing. So uh, maybe that calm comes from a daily repetition of something that you must do. It is a necessary activity. This is a foolish question, but because you're possibly one of the few people I know who reads Hindi and Urdu writing, one is envious of your facility with both languages and literatures. I've often wondered at this deep elegiac tone in Urdu writing, whether it's poetry or prose, why is it so marked? And it's the kind of defining uh, feature of some of the finest writing that one has read in translation. So I can't say I've read Urdu. On the other hand, in Hindi literature and in Hindi writing of the same time, you don't find this kind of sorrow, this deep undercurrent of sorrow. Why do you think that is uh, so? Uh, uh, I don't think uh, all of it is very uh, sorrowful sure. because uh, humor, for instance, oh, is satire. highly developed in Urdu, which is not in Hindi. Yeah, yeah. You hard, can hardly find anything humorous in Hindi. Yeah. But in Urdu, this uh, is highly developed yeah. form. Yeah. So there's that. And uh, it's also, uh, I suppose, uh, what you call the sort of uh, melancholic sort mm -hmm. of world is also because it's partly nostalgic, but it's partly nostalgic for a way of being that is maybe rapidly vanishing, you know, something like that. So it just comes into the stories also. So uh, I don't know. It it's must be that. <laughs> okay. hmm. Do we have time for a question? Or maybe one. Fuzel also had his hand up. So we have two people who, and there are a couple of, so we have to. Uh, and professor and oh Rita has, Rita has a question Here sorry so there are a lot of people so maybe just uh, maybe we can take a couple of responses to questions together and then Sarah can respond to that so yeah Rita Rita Sarah I was very interested in you as a 
as someone who's reading, as someone who's curating, translating, writing. And I'm thinking of the worlds that you occupy, you create in your literary imagination and the writers you choose to read and talk about. And uh, for want of a better word, uh, it seems to me some of it, this particular Hindu, uh, Hindi Urdu literary sphere that you gravitate to is characterized by a certain kind of modernity. Uh, and I was curious to know whether I'm not saying you're consciously gravitating to it, but kuch to hai, kuch un cheezo mein hai jo bande hue tumhe, tumhare kaam mein and the things that you are, you gravitate to. There is a particular something. And uh, while people have talked about repose and calm and all of that, and we've talked about it in other contexts, but I'm also wondering if you want to think a little bit about whether there is a particular kind of a, a certain modernity of this sphere which has attracted you and if it has what do you think are its characteristics do you want to respond what? to that or do you want to also listen to what and then uh, let's take the other okay. questions and okay. then we can yeah. respond together yeah uh, thank you for that uh, very interesting uh, paper uh, i just i'm actually very intrigued with your title because uh, with the when the question of form in nayar masood is coming up we, you know considering the fact that the effect of the question, you know, the focus on form that the Urdu modernist short story, the Jadid Afsana really does in the 60s, does have an influence on Masood when he's writing, especially in the first two collections, right? That emphasis on form is almost given up in the third and fourth collections. And he uh, focuses more on the content. So my question with regards to your title is, do you think there is in Masood a possibility of even finding the form in the form of expressivity or whatever the form that he is trying to, you know, look for because of the effect of the Jadid Afsan? Right. Uh, do you think that uh, Masood wants to uh, uh, actually even find a form or is, there, is this aesthetics essentially one of giving up the search for form? Shall I, shall I answer now? Uh, well, uh, finding a form is not Masood trying to find a form. It's we trying to find a form, the form that Masood is using. And uh, as far as tradition goes and being influenced by earlier writers, he does not follow any norms as such, no literary norms. The one person that he does say that he was possibly influenced by is an Urdu writer called Ghulam Hussain. And uh, I have not read Ghulam Hussain, so I'm, I can't say where the similarity would lie with Masood. But uh, there's certainly no one like him either before, and it's very unlikely that anyone will be like him after. So uh, the question of tradition as such does not arise with uh, uh, Masood. And uh, I mean, this is me trying to find a form that Masood is writing in, you know, and Masood is not doing it. He's writing his own thing and he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He's writing, as he says, he doesn't sort of write uh, in, uh, he doesn't write every day. He doesn't write, you know, one sentence following another. He writes one and then he forgets about it. Then he comes back to it, say, 20 days, one month, six months later, which is why it takes him so long to finish something. And uh, so it's, he just enjoys writing, but he doesn't uh, try to copy something. I mean, he does say that he learned from Kafka and Poe, but he doesn't mention any other influences on his work. And... Uh, well, as far as modernity goes, Rita, I mean, uh, I think just the very sort of the style that he uses is modern. And Vinod Kumar Shukla also, I mean, they are writing in something, uh, you know, something that's very new. It's a very plain style, but is also very new and eccentric. So maybe that's what uh, attracts uh, me, attracted me to their writing. And uh, I write a very staid prose. So I don't know how you found that, why you would say that I'm... Uh, Sort of because of my own writing, I am attracted to people who are like that. Yeah. So uh, modernity is only in the style, I would say. In, and the, uh, I mean, because Vinod Kumar Shukla is also writing about the everyday, but he's writing it in a way that it makes it seem very modern and different. And he's certainly not influenced by any European writer or anyone else, you know, because he's not read them. He doesn't read English very, very easily. So he has not read them. And so he's clearly writing something that's coming from his own uh, thing. And even the poems are so, uh, well, you could call them weird and if that word can be used for him, weird and wonderful. So he is, he is completely himself. 
as with Masood also, like nobody else can be like them quite because people have tried to uh, write like Minot Kumar Shukla in Hindi and people have tried in, uh, to write like Nayar, but I mean, nobody, I think, is quite able to get that. Thank you so much. This was great. I mean, I think the word state prose will never be the same again. It's like the smell of camphor. And with that smell, and now we can head out to lunch. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Majumdar, and thank you, Saraji, for taking us towards finding Masood's world of the magical, the strange, the calm, and the modern. Uh, we will all break for lunch and be back here in 25 minutes. Thank you. Just let him show me that really came out very well.
Thank <laughs> you. 
um welcome back everyone um as we are approaching the conclusion of the symposium today i feel like uh, or i have at least heard active uh, uh, acceptances and claims of being bust sarah ji was talking about it earlier and i just heard kartika in the corridor saying that she is a bust publisher <laughs> kartika is uh, going to be chairing uh, uh, the seventh session of the symposium uh, the session uh, uh, or the presentation will be by charles boyle who's joining us online on zoom i will quickly introduce kartika the chair of this session the session is called bust writers bust publishers kartika vk is publisher westland books she has spent over 25 years editing and publishing fiction non fiction translations poetry and graphic novels she started her career at Penguin Books India and spent a decade as publisher, HarperCollins Publishers, uh, before moving to Westland, where she set up Context, an imprint that focuses on literature and politics. She has published several award-winning and commercially successful writers. And uh, uh, as you already know, that Westland is the co-publisher of the literary activism series, which is sort of a response to both these ideas of being award-winning and commercial. So Kartika, in that sense, is uh, uh, holding it all together. I invite Kartika to chair the session and to introduce the speaker, Charles Boyle. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjit. I'm delighted to meet you, Professor Boyle. I heard that you were going to be here, but that for various reasons that I think people know, um, paperwork reasons, perhaps. He couldn't make it here. So we're going to have to do this online. But yes, I mean, as a bust publisher who's uh, trying to find um, their feet again, it's really interesting to talk about bust writing and publishing. And I've been listening to the morning sessions with great attention and interest. Um, but what strikes me about Professor Boyle, who's writer, poet, publisher, um, also someone who started up a publishing house, uh, CB Editions, is that there always seems to be something you're doing to get out of bust into boom. I mean, you have taken on pseudonyms to write fiction. You have uh, decided to start a publishing house when you couldn't find, I, or so I read, uh, the right publisher for poetry that you wanted to publish, um, which just seems to me the perfect way to now, these days, negotiate even the literary spaces because they are fast closing in, the mainstreaming of everything is the bane of experimental writing, writing that you really wish more people would discover. And in these movements away from the mainstream, I think is where real creativity and literary activism lies. So I'm delighted to be um, able to listen to you and hopefully we will ask you some questions later, but handing over to you now. Thank you. Kartika, thank you very, very much. Um, Sanchit, is this working? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. I hope so. I have never been invited to an occasion of this kind before, which means I feel completely qualified to be here. And I'm only so sorry that I can't be with you in person. There were bureaucratic problems, there were health problems, but let's see how it works. Um, is this working? I'll carry on then. 
Um, it's working. Uh, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank Sanchez and I thank Amit and I thank everybody who has made this happen. Um, I've added um, a subtitle, by the way. We now have bus writers, bus publishers, a dance with improvised steps. In 1979, a man I know, a Welshman who translates from the Spanish, met a man named Roberto in a bar in a village in the south of France. And they talked about William Burroughs because the Welshman happened to be reading Burroughs. And later, they sat with more wine on a bench in a dusty park and watched some gypsy children playing football. Roberto joined in. Richard, by now so drunk that he didn't trust his legs to hold him upright, stayed seated. Richard believes that the man he met was Roberto Bolaño. A quote from a talk that Richard gave in Santiago that was based on this episode. He seemed to have an intense grasp of world literature, had the wild range and anarchic confidence of the autodidact, which I recognised. And he seemed to really like talking, enjoyed the chase of ideas and wordplay and of any insane incongruence that came along. Now, whether this particular Roberto was Bolaño or not, I don't think really matters. I happen to believe with Richard that it was. In 1979, Richard was 23 and Bolaño was 26. Richard was bust. He had quit the UK when Margaret Thatcher was elected into power and he went to southern France and Spain, vagabonding. He was young. Life is not easier when you are young, but decision-making sometimes is. And he went to pick grapes and drink them, up to around seven litres of cheap wine per day. The other guy was also bust. I think Bolaño at the time was starting to write the pieces that make up Antwerp, that unpublishable at the time book of anarchic confidence that is seen now following Bolaño's ascension as, I quote from a cover, the big bang of his creative universe. Fast forward a decade or two, or three or four. Bolaño died in 2003 at the age of 50 while waiting for a liver transplant and is now a star of global literature. Richard did get a liver transplant and became a university professor of creative and, and, creative and critical writing. He has described attending a literary conference in Barcelona. From the window of his hotel room, he looked out on the market stalls of Las Ramblas, under which during his vagrant years he had slept. From another hotel room, this one in Paris in 1978, Lawrence Durrell looked out on the city in which he had run around with Henry Miller and Anais Nin in, 90, in 40 years before. Durrell in 1978 was in the boom stage of his life, a major beast a member of the literary firmament. But he discovered a tenuous shop-bought link to his bust stage. He spent the night of the 31st of December with a woman who wore a perfumed named after Anais Nin. Ten days later, he wrote to Henry Miller, I lay there in the dark, smelling it and thinking and never saying a word. Authors become aromas? Author names become brand names? File that perfume with the Samuel Beckett fridge magnets, the Pessoa tea towels, the James Joyce t-shirts and the Bolaño t-shirts too, and the Bolaño 2666 beach towel. At the core of 2666 are the unsolved murders and rape and mutilation of several hundred women in Mexico forensically recorded. For $35, you can lie on the beach on a Bolaño 2666 towel, quote from the ad, 
made from brushed microfiber with 100% cotton back for extra absorption. I'm using the term, the terms boom and bust quite loosely here. Like most simple binaries, the terms don't always fit neatly, but they do offer a framework for talking. And in writers' so-called careers, bust to boom, and sometimes vice versa, is a perceived trajectory from messing around in cafes to ordering room service on an expense account. From calling your dealer to calling not just your dealer, but your agent and your lawyer and your accountant too. What happens along the way? I am not sure that the work is always, as Amit put it in his mission statement, annulled. I'll mention here another man I know, an Irishman this time, who came across some books by Bellagno on my shelves and borrowed one. And within weeks, he too had quit the UK and headed to the south of France. Bust or boom, books can change lives. And I think work's worth can survive however it is framed, marketed, sold, press ganged into alien agendas or ignored. But yes, during the movement from bust to boom, something is lost or stolen or sold short or surrendered or forgotten or just goes missing. And now I'm going to talk for a little while about publishing because I think that's why I'm here because I worked in mainstream publishing for more years than I care to remember, including 14 years in backroom jobs, that's copy editing and typesetting, at Faber and Faber, before going it alone. For mainstream publishing, I offer you two images. First, there was a photo of last year's Booker Prize winner a week or so after the prize. He's sitting slumped at a table in what looks like the back room of a discount warehouse, head down on a table stacked with hardback copies of his book. After doing 60 interviews, he is now required to sign 2,000 copies of his book in one sitting. I've actually seen this happen. It needs a team of four. Uh, one intern opens the books passes to the writer, who signs. Another intern restacks in piles, another makes coffee. The interns are, quote, learning how publishing works, stop quote. Second image, a wicker work trolley filled with manuscripts. In shape and size, think of a shopping trolley, the kind you see tugged along by people with bad backs coming back from the mall. But those ones tend to be waterproof. When I joined Faber in the early 1990s, this trolley belonged to Frank, who wheeled it every day from the post room to his office. The manuscripts were the so-called slush pile sent in by helpful writers, and Frank spent his days panning for gold. If I remember rightly, Frank found Upamanu Chatterjee's English August in this trolley. For the past several years, Faber's website and those of other big publishers has stated, unfortunately, we are not in a position to re re review unsolicited manuscripts. You need an agent. While the range of writers making it through to publication has expanded, the route from outside to inside is now policed by more, not fewer, gatekeepers. I'm a gatekeeper myself. As a small press publisher, I say no to many more writers than I say yes to. My own venture began in 2007. It is ramshackle and it doesn't make money and it has no Arts Council funding and was started by accident and I have never learned how to make a spreadsheet and I probably never will. 
And by saying those things, I am framing it, whether I want to or not, in a bust tradition. I'll begin with Richard, the Welshman who met Bolaño and who I first met online. In 2011, Richard published on his blog some draft translations of poems by an Argentinian poet, Joaquin Gianuzzi, who died in 2004. I liked them, and I emailed Richard, and the following year we published a bilingual edition of his translations of selected poems by Gianuzzi. Incidentally, the first poem in the book is titled Garbage at Daybreak. Garbage collecting, of course, was one of Bolaño's down-at-heel jobs back in the early years. And here are lines from the final stanza, quote, it seems that culture consists in the thorough tormenting of matter and pushing it through an implacable intestine. End of quote. Richard persuaded his university <clears throat> to fund a mini festival in Cardiff, where I met Latin American writers and translators who were new to me. To date, the book of Gianuzzi's poems has sold 71 copies to bookshops and 54 copies to individual readers ordering from the website. I sent out review copies, which resulted in two reviews in small circulation Welsh and Scottish magazines, which resulted, which, um, and I must have given away quite a few because actually I've only got three copies left. And when those are sold, the book will go out of print. None of us has a long shelf life. 71 plus 54 equals 125. Small numbers. Of course, I'd like them bigger, but not too big, because I'd get swamped. The trick may be in keeping them at ground level. In January this year, I published a book that sold out its first print run of 500 within a week of publication. And as much as I was riding high, I was also on the back foot, juggling the cash flow to pay for a reprint. My publishing is not a numbers game, but here are a few more, just for context. Back in 2007, a legacy of £2,000 from an uncle who made it to the age of 100 and quit, funded the printing of 250 copies each of four books. And that was supposed to be that. But I was enjoying this. And so another four books the next year and the next and the next. And they earned their keep. Just about. And to date, there have been around 80 titles. A very few have sold more than 3,000 copies. Many more have sold around 100. Enough numbers. Much more interesting is how some of the authors I publish involve themselves in the curation of the list. Writer A tells me about meeting B, who has been translating C from the French for years, not for publication, but just for the fun of using those muscles. I publish them. And while B in America, he is, and while in America, B hears D from Mexico, reading from her manuscript. Can she send it? She did. I published it. E, who lets me publish her stories, not least because I also published the Hungarian writer F, whom E once stayed up all night reading through to dawn, takes some coffees of her book to New York, where she meets and hangs out with G, who of course sends me her po his poems, and they are good, and I publish them too. H, who is Polish, is constantly trying to interest me in little-known Polish writers from the early and mid-20th century, and I've published his translations of two of them. I also seem to attract less actively social writers, ones in whom a desire for recognition conflicts with a wariness about the whole business of publishing. After I'd taken on a book-length narrative poem by Jay, 
I found he had written about half a dozen other books. He was a self-taught bookbinder, and he had handbound a couple of copies of each, showed them to showed these to two or three friends who were completely non-literary, and when they returned them, he had put them under his bed and started a new book. Jay is now a prize-winning author with a much larger publisher, and he is still conflicted. Kay in France sent me a very short book he had been working on for 30 years without seriously attempting to publish it. When I took round finished copies of the book by L, which I published seven weeks after reading the manuscript because he had cancer and was dying, he suggested I take a copy to his local bookshop where he was a regular customer. And they said, yes, lovely man, but we didn't know he was a writer. M. M is a poet I said no to. And then two years later reconsidered at three in the morning, one sleepless night. And he hadn't sent the poems anywhere else. He'd just been waiting for me to change my mind. And by breakfast time, this book was on track. M writes under a pen name, as I do sometimes. And there is almost no evidence of this man's existence, certainly no photos. And he refuses offers of readings, and I have never met him, though we live in the same city. And I am frankly terrified of the several hundred new poems he would like me to publish, but I can't do everything. These people are my tribe. Here they all are, quarreling, teasing, belonging even the shy ones. And I could get sentimental about this, and sometimes I do. Some of them might feel at home in Bologna's stories of stubborn, fragile, haunted, obsessive, drifting writers. One of those stories features a little magazine named White Rope, from which the narrator was excluded. Quote, Two Chileans was one, two Chilean, too many for the first issue of a little magazine devoted to Spanish writing, end quote, and which folded after just one issue. In 2015, I started a little magazine myself. It was called Son of a Book, and it lasted for two issues. After the first issue, edited by myself, I put it in the hand of guest editors. The first guest editor never delivered. He was caring for his father, who became ill and then died. The next issue did appear, with almost all of the work in translation, but the very young child of the guest editor succumbed to a very rare illness and died. Soon after the editor of the next issue started work, a father became ill and died. I pulled the plug. When a project has a curse on it, there's not much else you can do. Small magazines were a characteristic feature of the alternative publishing scene in the UK in the period between the end of the Second World War and the coming of the internet, which is now, I think, can be seen as a very specific historical period. The magazines and pamphlets and broadsheets were often printed on office duplicating machines and they were staple bound. And they were sold or bartered at book fairs in drafty halls, at readings in pubs and in radical independent bookshops. And most were short lived. There were alliances and then breakups and schisms. The people producing this material were typically, obviously I'm generalizing, male, white, working class, left wing, and living quite far outside London and outside Oxford and Cambridge. This is Bolognesque. We now have the internet and digital printing too, but there are two ways in which my own venture may be considered a descendant of this bust tradition. One is the DIY aspect. I do all the typesetting and design, including the covers myself, and the queuing in the post office, and the accounts, and the dealing with printers, and the logging of boxes of books around. 
The second way, the micro scale of this venture allows for reading, writing and publishing to be not discrete activities, but part of a continuum. A dance, if you like. When publishing becomes a specialized activity, primarily devoted to making money, this dance becomes awkward. In a dance between a boom publisher and a bust writer, the partners are so unequal that the relationship is essentially predatory. Sometimes it goes wrong. The bust writer, John Healy, was alcoholic and homeless for more than a decade, sleeping rough. Because of the vagrancy laws in the UK at the time, he was often in prison, where he learned to play chess. He won tournaments and became a professional, but he gave that up after five years because chess too had become a stressful addiction. He wrote a memoir that was published by Faber in 1988, and the book sold many thousands and won the major UK prize for autobiography. And then Healy turned up at Faber's office one day to ask for money due to him. And when he was fobbed off, he said he'd come back with an axe. Or maybe a hammer. Accounts vary. Faber pulped the remaining copies of his book and told Healy they would never publish him again. Other publishers blacklisted him. Fifteen years later, the book was republished as a Penguin modern classic. But when you are in clinical depression, so what? In a documentary film about, Healy's, about Healy, Faber's editorial director, the son of a headmaster of Eton, reminisces, quote, We thought we were cutting edge, radical, new voices. But actually, when a new voice turned up, we didn't know what to do with it. End quote. The tricky terrain here was social class, middle class publishers and a working class author, the son of Irish immigrants, both out of their comfort zones. Another form of predatory dance is big publishers letting smaller ones test the water first. Big, big publishers are not worried by the small ones, they use them. A number of books I have published that have gained acclaim, typically by winning prizes, those little badges that tell both you and everyone watching that you have arrived, have been taken over by larger publishers. And sometimes I left, I'm left with boxes of books that I'm not legally allowed to sell. Never mind the fact that 99% of bust writers stay bust, which is another word for broken, and broke is another word for having no money. This process enacts the surefire rags to riches trope that sells books and becomes part of the perceived identity of those books, and often of the writers too. In any capitalist society, rags to riches a trope in which I'd include survival against the odds and suffering followed by hope and redemption and in general, in general, happy endings, is the trump card, the trope you, they want you to buy into. And people generally do, even while knowing that very, very few make it through. And in fact, that the whole system is based on making it through being an exception. I don't for a moment hold it against writers that they move from a small publisher to a bigger one. They deserve more readers than I can deliver, and they have bills to pay. And if you have any self-awareness, then being in a bus tradition is hardly comfortable. It's cliquey, it's factional, and it's depressingly worthy. And it is romanticized. Being an outsider is not a lifestyle choice, it is hard. I am simply observing the interdependent but often strained relationship between boom, which has a homogenizing effect on the market, 
If you like X, we will also try to sell you Y and bust, which defines itself against boom, but which really does want to stall in the marketplace. Just a little one, please. The marketplace, where we buy our vegetables and our underwear and our books too. Boom in publishing is basically about money with a veneer of culture, gloss lamination. Once we've subscribed to capitalism, this is how it is. And although we, preserving our cultivated disdain of money, know that success as defined by the marketplace does not mean that the writers of books that sell in their tens of thousands are better than the writers who sell far fewer, we are still infected by the sales charts. Money can empower, but it can also get in the way and skew judgment. I take no money when a writer I've published sells rights to their book to a larger publisher. A friend who runs a gallery in London takes no commission when an artwork she has shown is sold. In both cases, our failure to monetize indicates to many who should really know better that we are not serious players, that we are not professional. A certain glamour sometimes attaches to bust writers, to bust publishers and gallerists less so. Back to numbers. If boom publishing is essentially about money, then Balanya's publishers have to invest in him and sell as many books in as many possible territories as they can, because they can only make money by selling in mass volume. Between an editor's desk and a customer in a bookshop, there are others who take a cut along the way, and no one dines out off small print runs. For example, say in the UK, I publish a book with a cover title of £10. In the UK, the wholesaler who supplies most independent bookshops buys that book off the distributor at a discount of 60% off the cover price, sometimes more. After paying the printer's bill and then the distributor's fee and the sales agent's fee and royalties to the author, I, as publisher, am left with two pence, more or less. Often, now with rising print costs, less. I said earlier that the trick was keeping the numbers at ground level, but below ground level? Failure is obviously more interesting than success. To write is to fail. Fail again, fail better, said Beckett, who failed so spectacularly that he won the Nobel Prize in Literature, giving credence to failure as a mark of authenticity, which is therefore co-opted, although not as an actual strategy, into boom publishing. Bologna's backstory, the drifting, the illness, the working on campsites and other menial jobs, becomes the prelude to his global triumph. I recently read a short story by Shirley Hazard about an Italian scholar who works on his unfinished, unfinishable book and meets up in the evenings with bookish friends at the local cafe. Quote, The possibility of worldly success had never by then, by them been entertained. They conjectured only as to the form their failure would take. End quote. Failure's forms a legion. And unless you think life and literature is a competition, most of them are not really failure at all. I'm still in touch with Connor, the Irishman who read Bologna and went off to the south of France, where he still is. He reads, he gives English lessons, sometimes he writes. His liver is healthy. I was in Hungary in around... 2009 with H, the Polish translator, whose real name is Vishek, when he bought 
a rundown house in a small town, a house abandoned for decades. I asked him what, after he'd fixed the place up, he would do there, and he looked at me as if I was stupid. Read, write, listen to music, do some translation. And harvest the berries from the mulberry tree in the back garden to distill bottles of the local liquor known as palinka. A year or so back, over glasses of palinka or similar, Vishek suggested we get a second hand van, fill it with boxes of the books I publish, and drive around Europe, visiting independent bookshops that stock English language books. It would be fun. We would meet interesting people. We would have adventures. It could be a disaster. We might never speak to each other again, but worth trying? I told him that there would be post-Brexit customs difficulties and that getting even friendly shops to take in books is hard and there wasn't a chance we would cover our costs. But maybe... That's not the point. Again, Vishet looked at me as if I was stupid. Well, I am stupid. And so is he. We like each other. And I realised while writing this that while both he and I flirt with success, not boom, a few hundred copies sold would be nice, a couple of good reviews in good places. The point is not success, failure, neither but the dance we are engaged in. In this case, a dance in which the partners are equal and most of the steps are improvised. Finally, to give you a quite realistic idea of the scale of this operation, a very short poem by the German poet Gunter Eich, translated by Michael Hoffman. The title of the poem, which is ironic and hilarious, but is also absolutely serious, is optimism. I have a reader in Salonika and another in Bad Neuheim. That makes two already. Uh, one more final paragraph because we resist completion. Here's a tip. Tickets at major galleries for the retrospective exhibitions of big-name artists, both the quick and the dead, are expensive. Sometimes, if you hang around the exit, where there may be nobody asking to see your ticket, you can get in free. I think some bust artists know this, and I think the galleries know this too, and they factor it into the ticket prices. It's like shoplifting. What you get going in from the exit is the official narrative in reverse. You start with the big, late paintings, loose, free, defiant energy, licensed by critical and commercial success, energised by rage against dying. High prices at auction. Only banks, oligarchs and national galleries with massive state subsidy will be able to own these works. The middle rooms, dealers, prizes, money, marriages, schisms, travel, experimentation. Sometimes wilderness years and massive self-doubt and fragile recovery. The best known works, the ones reproduced on the tote bags and the t-shirts, and they are extraordinary, are in these rooms. Eventually you reach the first room. Small pieces using cheap materials. The work done while the artist was feeling their way, finding their peers. Before there was a market for their work, let alone a secondary market. Before they were they. Before they had made their name. Before a dealer had decided that their name was worth making. Before they became their name. Before their name became a fridge magnet. You have come a long way against the flow. Galleries are exhausting. Sit down, but there are never enough chairs. They want you in and then out to make room for more. You still have to weave through the gift shop and pass the list of corporate sponsors and their logos. And then you go home 
feed the kids, do the laundry, check your emails, and maybe you're right. Nobody is telling you to do this, and nobody is promising you any rewards. But equally, no one is stopping you. Thank you. Thank you. That was quite marvelous. I felt entirely uh, akin with everything that you were saying. I've been in big publishing houses. I um, have been in mid-sized and small publishing houses. And I think the word that you used last of scale, that is always the biggest problem for us. I think here in India, we have the same problems that you may have as a small publisher, but we have the additional problem which is all Indian publishers working in the English language also have this big master sitting across in the UK or the US. And it's always a one-way process. The books have to come from the West to India, and this is a big market for them. But nothing ever goes from here to there unless it is an agented and you know locally published product. It's as though nobody there really needs to know or read material that comes out of here as a sort of almost organic, natural process. So just two things that came to mind when you were talking. One was this legendary uh, story about Andrew Wiley, the agent who uh, I think had inspired younger agents by saying that your job is to get the biggest advance you can possibly get for a writer. And if royalties follow, then you failed. Because really, the agent's job is to take the biggest advance possible and run. I mean, it's not about making sure that the writer has a lifelong uh, sort of royalty statement coming to them in the positive. The second thing is about a small publisher in the UK. I don't know if you remember them. They were called Beautiful Books, I think. And uh, they started up really small. I remember going to the London Book Fair once, and they had a stall with a few books. And they published a writer who was Indian uh, who went, went on to win the Costa Prize for fiction, the first book uh, prize. And they got so excited. They were a small publisher. They'd never you know, won anything. And they printed masses of this book, expecting it to then take off in a very big way and had cash flow problems. They could not pay the printers in time. The book didn't sell as much. And they went bust just on the strength of that one prize that should have actually transformed their destiny. Um, so it's just, I think publishing is just full of weird and wonderful stories about people who just put everything they have into making it work. And then sometimes like you do clearly take a great deal of pleasure in what you do. And that just makes perhaps makes it all worthwhile, I think. Uh, it sounds like it. Uh, but then there are those who just work all the time trying to get the numbers and the data and just lose all the pleasure in what they're doing. And I just think it's nice to be smaller and take that everyday publishing just means a working with people, working with writers of the sort that you, and you know, the kind of a challenge that is to you on a daily basis, no other publishing or no other profession can offer, I think. So thank you for that talk. It just felt so resonant. I'm going to ask the um, audience if they have questions and uh, direct them to you. Maybe you should come here and speak, right? Then he can see you if you have questions or comments. Anybody? That's strange, just publishing silence writers and academics. <laughs> <laughs> Karthika, a phrase you mentioned in the introduction, you, you used the phrase holding it together. Yep. Um, I think that's what I spend a lot of my days doing. You know, and there are times during every day when I feel it's all coming apart. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know that feeling. But you know, the one thing that you did not really, uh, perhaps we didn't touch upon this, is do you feel that pressure of performance for your writers nowadays? Because we're feeling it a great deal here. They have to go to festivals. They have to be, you know, on uh, social media. They have to perform all the time the writing that they do or the mind behind the writing. Sometimes even the body behind the writing. I mean, some of the most popular writers now are those who have, to have Insta handles that showcase them in the gym or doing wonderful, happy things. So is that performance angle important for your poets and writers? Some of them enjoy doing it, fine. 
Some of them really do not enjoying it, also fine. I mentioned the writer who basically refuses to have any photographs of himself anywhere and who refuses offers of readings. Um and this is this is fine by me. You know, it it's I mean if I like the work, I will publish the work. But I can do this at this scale. <laughs> That's true, actually. The bigger publishers, I think now rarely seem to pick up even this or sign on a writer who does not have a presence. Indeed. And I think in some publishers' contracts with their writers, you actually have to sign along the dotted line to a contract that includes clauses that say you will tweet so so many tweets per week or something like this. Okay, um, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Um, you want to ask? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think you may need to come up here, right? No? We can be safe. Perfect. A question for you. Um, Charles, thank you so much for that uh, paper. I think in some ways you've stunned us into silence with some <laughs> Incredible contradictions. I don't know if it's sort of Gramsci's pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. I love that optimism poem. <laughs> and it's, you know, depressing sort of two readers. Um, I, I, I I don't really know what question I'm asking. It's just interesting <laughs> that, 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 you know, you, you seem to combine this you know, cynicism, understandably, about the boom and 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 and, and 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 the commercial nature of publishing with this grim, you know, your story was punctuated with death, right? This terrible story of this <laughs> short-lived uh, uh, periodical where which has its curse. And yet this will to keep on going and that you're doing what you're doing. You too, And you've said sometimes you get sentimental, you know, about your writers and your tribe and so on. So I think I think perhaps if you stand us into silence, it's because I think we felt quite keenly, right, those contradictions, the, the sense of pessimism, cynicism, distrust of sentimentalization, of romanticizing the bus. And yet this extraordinary energy to keep going because it's worth doing it for for, for reasons that may be difficult even to say there are good reasons and bad reasons i mean to be honest i think my publishing to some extent is an addictive activity um i i as i said i started the first four books there were no plans to do any more but i was enjoying this so did another four um and then another four and there was a period about seven years ago when I was feeling pretty exhausted and I kind of retired. But like many other addictions, actually, it's a lot more difficult to quit than just kind of carry on. At a kind of, you know, kind of cut down maybe. Hmm. But um, I, I can't imagine not doing this really. Hmm. I bet I don't. I don't make a. I, I, I'm in an extraordinarily privileged position to be able to do this. It was pure luck and chance that I worked in mainstream publishers' offices during the '90s when they had these new toys on their desks and they realised they could use them um, to design and to typeset and so on. So I picked up some basic know-how so I can do this myself. I don't have to pay anybody else to do it. Um, and being of a certain age, I you know I know. A, 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 know a few writers and they know other writers and we all kind of trust each other so it's a position I work this is only enabled by my having had a certain life experience yeah sure no no there is but that's okay no please go ahead hi um Hello, Amit. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, just uh, yeah, a, a couple of questions. One of them is uh, uh, personal in the sense of being related to your life as a publisher and, and possibly as a writer. And the other is asking you um, to sort of throw light on, on something uh, um, to do with publishing. Um, the, the the first question is, um, observation is, well, you you seem to have been on, on an adventure. I, I, I'm not sure exactly, I, I can't remember now the date of embarking on that uh, adventure. You, you mentioned it, I think. 
2007, that's 16 years. 2010, ago. yeah. So you're in Faber and then you shifted and then you embarked on an adventure. Um, and uh, Sartre says in a couple of places, he defines adventure as something that you cannot be aware of being in. It's only in retrospect that you realize that an adventure becomes an adventure in the recounting. Nobody, he says at least, is aware of being in an adventure. I'm in an adventure. And I have written about this in the past, and I've, I've disagreed with it in the sense that one can be in, a, in an adventure if one embarks on something where one knows there is no assured outcome. If you're doing something with enthusiasm and you're not sure what the outcome will be, you or you're not sure if you're going to get any money from it, you're probably aware that you have embarked on an adventure. Now, I, I was wondering whether you were aware of being in an adventure at any point. Uh, that was the first question, or whether whether you don't think this is an adventure at all, or whether it became something that you became aware of over time, that I have been in an adventure for, for some years now. I don't know where it's going, but you know this is what's happening. Um, I don't know why I'm in it, but you know I'm in one. Look, that, that was one question. The other question has to do with uh, mainstream publishing uh, because you were part of that as well and you've been an observer, you've been part of that whole world. So uh, as far as I can see, the new press, which by the way came up in conversation earlier today, um, the new press were, was existed, uh, was created in the time of economic deregulation in the 90s, uh, early, uh, uh, early 90s, 92. Uh, but it, it, you know, it, came, it emerged as an important uh, uh, independent publisher in New York. I mean, that's at least what I'm getting from Wikipedia right now. I thought it was earlier that it came into existence, but it's, Wikipedia says 1992, which is surprising to me. However, I have read an, an interview with Andre Schifrin, uh, where he says that you know the, the whole model for mainstream publishers was uh, we, we we publish the bestsellers to subsidize the writers we really want to publish. And that model did go out of the window with globalization and, and the free market uh, in the sense that even academic publishers like Cambridge University Press decided ev every writer will have to earn their keep. We are not subsidizing any writers. We are not selling you know, Bridget Jones's diary in order to publish X, Y, or Z, who doesn't sell that much. Um, then I heard later on that it's that a certain so that at a certain point of time, at least a few literary publishers real, realized that this model of you know every writer earning their keep, um, the, 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 the overtly commercial model, um, wasn't working even commercially for these publishers. So I was wondering whether you had a sense that there's been any turn in the last 10 years in mainstream publishing, uh, towards taking stock of the, the the kind of model they had adopted after globalization or the you know the the, the kind of uh, the spread of the free market as the only form uh, of uh, looking at finance and uh, profit making and the economy um, or whether there's be or whether it's got worse or whether the, the, you know it's is continues to be the same uh, um, as it became in the world of the free market, con conglomerates buying over uh, publishing houses and a whole new ethos coming into existence. So two questions, adventure and the other one. I'll start with the other one. Oh, Lord. He's asking me a question as though I'm an expert. I'm not an expert. Um, the new press that you mentioned is uh, was the venture that started up by Andre Schifrin um, several years after he resigned or was forced to resign from Pantheon. Um, Pantheon, which uh, he'd worked at since, I think, 1961, in which he published Studs Terkel, Simone de Beauvoir, um, a whole lot of interesting, radical writers. And under that model of um, highly commercial imprints and books subsidizing lesser uh, books which the sales department expected to sell fewer um to my mind this this was um this was allowing 
this was this so non-commercial books in a sense were being allowed to be published under license and when the kind of corporate thing kind of turned over on itself and just started eating itself that license was revoked um because commercial capital only takes you so far and the bottom line um basically said andre Schifrin, you have lost us three million dollars in the last year you've got to cut your list all your titles and he refused it was a kind of it was a kind of moment um but i still think all the time Schifrin was at pantheon publishing the radical list he did publish um pantheon was owned by another company which was in turn owned by another company which is in turn owned by another company these um the the takeovers and the globalization was was actually kind of it, it it hit the heights in the 1990s, but the, it had begun start started to rumble before. And I have only a certain amount of respect for Schifrin. And then he wrote that book about um, I forget what the title, but the subtitle was how 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 corporates have destroyed um, publishing and reading too. Um, my copy of that book, um, which I have on the shelf next to me. Um, on the back page, it says printed in the UK by Amazon. In other words, pretty well the prime corporate that the book was written to open our eyes to the evil of. <laughs> um, in other words, I think I, the, the globalization and the corporatization of publishing, there's almost no way out except by, this is another word, except by kind of ducking down and finding the interstices and, and operating there. Mm. Um, as for, you know, wither publishing, I'm, I'm, I'm the wrong person. Mm. Um, as for adventure, I think, as I said, I, I started out with just four books and that was supposed to be a way of spending the legacy left to be my uncle but um, I did have some very lucky breaks um, with those first four books. Um, and you need lucky breaks as well. Uh, the, one of the one of that, those first four, actually two of those four books. The, okay, the four books were one was one was a translation from the Polish by the, the guy I mentioned called Wyszek. One was a short novel by a professional violinist. Um, who had taken his book to one of these um, agencies that had, that sees a gap in the market and advises on manuscripts for a certain fee and then takes the, the ones they think marketable onto an agent. And I was working for that agency at the time, and it was very depressing. Um, and I came across this manuscript, and which I thought was wonderful, and I, I got in touch with the guy directly and published it. Incidentally... The manuscripts that come into that agency, these are these are by authors who are writing away in their garrets and they want publication. And if they send to an agent, the agent either probably won't reply or will reply a year later saying, just not for us. And the authors want some kind of feedback and help. So there are these, in the UK anyway, there are these agencies Then you can send your manuscript and pay money and get a professional um a professional essay on your on your on your on your work. And I was getting sent these manuscripts and um, which divided on the whole into two. One, um, there were the oddball things that uh some of them were funny but not really interesting. Some of them were interesting in the sense that um, some, the, the, it was writing that really had to be written, and he didn't. You, but I couldn't see how any mainstream publisher would even begin to look at it. The bulk of the manuscripts that came in seemed to be carefully tailored to, for a position on the existing bookshelves. Look, there is that author, there is that author. Oh, um, there might just be a little space for me in between those two, if I can disguise myself as looking very like those. It was deeply depressing. Mm. And I and the two others of the first four titles were both by me. And one was a short novel. I published them both under pen names. Of course I did, because when you take books into a bookshop, 
um, uh, you don't have a distributor and you put them on your in your backpack and you take them into a bookshop and the bookseller says, mm, yes, who are these books by? If you say, well, they're actually by me, it's not really going to help. <clears throat> so I, they were both published under pseudonyms and one of them won a prize. And I thought, I'd, and that was a lucky break. And I thought we can do this. And then the next year I published one of Michael Hoffman's translations of um, his father's last novels. And I published um, a French poet called, translations of a French poet called Francis Ponge, who favorite picked up and then just let go out of print. Um, and as I say, it was, it was, it, it, it was becoming an adventure without me really knowing what was happening at all. There was no pre-planning to this. There was no marketing plan. There was no business plan. It was essentially making it up as I go along. The, at the point where I felt like, oh, I've had enough of this about seven years ago, I think one of the reasons I felt um, we can stop now was that to an extent, it had become a routine. Four or five books a year, get the manuscripts in, talk with the authors, design them, send them to print, and it had become a little bit routine. So I actually cut down to kind of just two books a year, like I cut attempted to cut down on cigarettes and then I'm I'm now back up to four or five books a year. Hmm. But yes, an adventure, but in retrospect, I had no idea what I was getting into. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Charles, why don't we have author like Salman Rasti who was quite uh, writing in his famous or infamous, and he was assaulted also. The way we have a very turmoil situation in our whole world, whether it's Russia, Israel, and other parts of the world. Do you think we will be having some more this type of author in near future? Um, many thanks for your question, which I didn't quite kind of get the gist of. Can you say it again? And I deeply right. apologize. Right. For I, I think what he's saying, Charles, is that writers like Salman Rushdie, who well sort of got into trouble about their politics, uh, but also wrote against the grain, is that the sort of writer we're going to see more of in these times? Is that correct? Yeah. Somewhat. Then. Ah, again, crystal ball. <laughs> I don't honestly know. I can't answer that question, I don't think. Um, I would... Possibly, in the sense that um, I do think um, there, there is no... What's writing for, anyway? I, there's no simple answer to that. But I think an act, the act of writing is is a form of resistance against the world that you are given and asked to sign on the dotted line to. So, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't give a fuller answer. Mm. Well, writing as resistance, I guess that's a good point to leave this at. Publishing can also be resistance, as you're yeah. clearly showing with your work. And uh, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Karika. Um, thank you, Karthika, and thank you, Charles. I mean, for us to do this live streaming and to be able to uh, have you with us online was certainly an adventure. And we are, we are, we are thankful to you. And thanks to all of you. We'll take another quick break and be back after tea. Thank you.
Um, welcome back, everyone. And uh, before we get going, uh, a reminder to please put your phones on silent or switch them off. Uh, we are not just approaching the end of the symposium. We are at the end of the symposium. And I don't know how Professor Chaudhary and I feel, who both of us have been at it for several months now, but uh, we are very excited, as I hope you would be too. For the last session of this two-day symposium, uh, this session or this talk will be uh, presented by Professor Shaikat Majumdar. It's titled, The Burst Tradition of Criticism as Art. This session will be chaired by Professor Roshinka Chaudhary, whom I will introduce. Professor Roshinka Chaudhary is Director and Professor of Cultural Studies at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. She was inaugural Mellon Professor of the Global South at Oxford University and has held visiting positions at King's College London, Delhi University, Cambridge University, and Columbia University. Uh, I invite both Professor Majumdar and Professor Chaudhary, and I thank you all for your patience. Uh, again, a reminder about the cell phones. Thank you. So it is a great pleasure and privilege uh, to be introducing Shoikat Mujumdar uh, today. I have known Shoikat for upwards of 30 years. I was calculating for how long I've actually known him, and it is a very long time uh, that we have known him. Um, because I think primarily, first, we share the same city, which made it possible for you to uh, meet us um, after you wrote that first letter on letter paper in handwriting <laughs> to Amit after reading A Strange and Sublime Address. Or was it the first two novels? Uh, maybe just the first one. Since then, we've met regularly over the, over the years. Um, after that first uh, uh, meeting, he became a regular visitor to our home, uh, to, uh, to at you know, coffee places, uh, uh, at other places in the, in the city. And his curiosity and involvement uh, with everything he comes into contact with meant that um, after a while, he became interested also in who I was and what I do, which led to many uh, conversations, long conversations, sometimes uh, without Amit uh, uh, present on. And this is what the conversations have always been uh, on over the years, as we've met intermittently, uh, books, ideas, people, and streams of thought. Um, I think what has always been very attractive uh, about Shoikot and the work he does has been his angularity to the mainstream, if I may put it like that. He might look like he wants to belong in the world, but I don't think as a writer, practitioner, academic critic, he actually uh, feels very much at home in it, which is, I think, a writerly instinct and an essential writerly instinct, perhaps. So I was somewhat surprised when I went to Wikipedia and was told that his novels primarily deal with themes and subjects like religion, memory, sexuality, history, and education. <laughs> um, for me, um, his novels are primarily sensory, vivid, alive. They're about the language. Uh, what comes across to me in their pages is the smells of things, the taste of things, um, just the texture of the time and the visual detail. The, the, these are what are very arresting to me. The other commonality, I think, across your novels and your criticism is the manner in which you put something of yourself into each of them. Shoikat has four novels. The first call was called Silverfish. It was published in 2015. By Kartika. Uh, by Kartika, yes. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, the second, uh, The Firebird, came out in 2015. The Scent of God, 2019. And The Middle Finger, 2022. All of them explore themes 
and sensations that belong to you, to, to your world, whether it is the theater, the, 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 the performance space in uh, Circa in, in in the Firebird, or whether it is the city itself, Calcutta in the silverfish, vividly uh, uh, the image that comes to mind is of uh, these condiments drying in the sun on the terrace uh, of an old house uh, in, in, in North Calcutta. And you belong to North Calcutta, of course, and you know those alleyways and those buildings so well. They're, they're, they're so much a part of you. So from there, then, it's not much of a jump to uh, the criticism uh, which first came out as Prose of the World in 2003, when Shoykot was still teaching at Stanford University. Um, the, the, the introduction is titled Poetics of the Prosaic, which I think is uh, something, again, that he has been concerned with all his life. Uh, so it's there in, in the writers he addresses over there, uh, as well as in the approach he takes to the material. Um, he edited uh, a collection from uh, Duke University Press called The Critic as Amateur. And he also has a book called College Pathways and Possibilities, which is about uh, liberal arts education and the, and, and, and the possibilities of that in India today. What is forthcoming is a novel uh, called The Remains of the Body and a book of criticism uh, called The Amateur, Self-Making and the Humanities in the Post-Colony. And in all of that, saying all of that, and I was going to conclude with that, when I suddenly remember to make a note to say, he is also, of course, Professor of English and Creative Writing at Ashoka University. So a very warm welcome to you, Shrikha. Thank you. I'm glad you, I was almost forgot the last part because the opening parts were so magnetic that I felt like I should just go on. So thank you so much for that, you know, deeply sensitive and generous introduction. I, I feel like I should retire already. <laughs> <laughs> from the talk anyway going just that going bust is the theme so uh, the title of this talk was initially was the lost tradition of criticism as art and then i the more i started thinking about the word bust i started to fall more and more in love with it that it's actually really more interesting than lost because the lost is okay there's enough romance about it you know we know the lost the wandering but as i said yesterday that this fascinating use of the language of finance and speculation, the stock market, you know, in bust and kind of thinking of thinking of art and literature in those lines and the element of imagination, like you're betting on things and then things. And we just heard a publisher say, kind of show the practical side of betting. And I think, as I said, I learned from Tim that there's a card game metaphor going bust, overplaying your hand. So I really thought it's a fascinating new way, a genuinely new way of describing things we've been trying to call alternative, minor, all of these things, but actually it's a genuinely new take. So with that in mind, the bus tradition of criticism as art. Writing for me often begins with a sensation, an image, a feeling, a memory, that of a smell or sight. Something that I can't make sense of but which still overpowers me. Like a half visible someone is taken by me and I'm taken by them and we must begin that dance to get closer together. Months, sometimes years of cohabitation follows before that can happen. And that happens only if the love is true because there are false flirtations too. What sensation? What memory? It could be incense. It could be the incense of prayer in a boy's boarding school, the memory of a loved one playing for love or death on stage. They have unleashed fiction for me. But writing about writing is no different. The memory of boredom of waiting endlessly in traffic jams or evenings without electricity or paperwork in a government office had started a book on boredom and fiction. The image of the inatt inattentive student at the back of the class, immersed in a book of their own, started another. Without a powerful sensation, an image, or a memory to push me, I find little that is worth saying to the world. Something happens to me when I meet criticism that melts abstraction of thought with the physicality of lived experience. 
or the haunting memory of it. I think with my body, with its shocks and sensations, it's an intense way of being alive. It happens with criticism that is pushed by the same impulse that shapes a poem, a painting, a novel. I quote, poetry can be only critique by poetry, wrote Friedrich Schlegel. Again, quote, a judgment of art that is not itself an artwork has no citizenship rights in the realm of art, end quote. No citizenship rights at all? I don't know about that. We do like others. We are not totally incestuous or cannibalistic. Take Tim's word. We love the disenchanted gaze of the social sciences, their rootedness in reason in spite of all the play with emotion. But I also want to make a case for some pure family time, something in the direction of critique of poetry by poetry, something like it, if not quite that. Critique is important, and not just a suspicion as articulated by Paul Ricoeur, and turned into an object of suspicion itself by the recent Rita Felsky. I'm thinking of criticism as a response to literature, much like a novel is a response to life. Sometimes the cracked looking glass of a servant, as Joyce's Stephen Dedalus might say. A response that is driven by impulses similar to what drives a poem, or a play, or a song, Ideas, sensation, memory, emotion. No discrimination between them and no hierarchies. Criticism that might even share structural features with them. Or even with other art forms such as those of painting or music. Some texture or design even when they don't actually claim artistic status. Art as primary and criticism as secondary is but an illusion. As nothing is primary at all. Art responds to other art just as often as criticism responds to it. It is not the principle but the manner of that response that distinguishes criticism from art. But there is criticism that breaks that manner too. For me, one such criti critic is Eka Ramanujan. Some of his most striking essays lack the linear trajectory of the argument that we expect from criticism. Instead of building, building the teleology of the conclusion, they offer a collage of ideas, examples, stories, personal anecdotes, poems of his own and of others, sometimes spread out like a fan or a flower rather than harnessed in a line that unfolds part by part towards a single goal. There is no movement towards a conclusion, just a scattering of ideas that follow the rhythm of a poem with a recurring refrain. Sometimes there is an idea stated in its fullness at the very beginning, then fleshed out in rich and occasionally contradictory ways. Take the way he opens his essay, Is There an Indian Way of Thinking? With the example of the dramatic exercise used by the director Stanislavski. The director would give his actors an ordinary sentence such as, bring me a cup of tea, and then have it in a range of ways, expressing a range of emotions from the polite to the aggressive. Bring me a cup of tea, 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 bring me a cup of tea. So it's all about where you put the accent. Everything changes depending on that. Likewise with the question, is there an Indian way of thinking? an emphasis on each of the words, you know, is there an Indian way of thinking? 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 And is there an Indian way of thinking? Each of the words yields a radically different question each time. Is there one indeed? Is it actually Indian? Is it really thinking? Can it be quite called a way? Meaning here emerges from sound and performance. Theatrical enactment is the primary condition that produces meanings, contained within the sign of the language. It reminds me of Sanjay Seth's interesting argument about the inseparability of pronunciation and meaning of words 
as practiced in the recitation of the Vedas. And I quote, the meaning of texts is imbricated with their sounds and the forms of their recitation, end quote. There is something essentially poetic about Ramanujan's beginning, the positioning of thought, of the open-endedness of the Indian way, something that also lives outside the Enlightenment tradition of reading and interpretation and the primacy of meaning over sound. For Ramanujan, For Ramanujan, poetry and performance paves the way for the semiotic significance of words, sound and rhythm before meaning. Stories follow quickly. First, the personal anecdotes about his father, the Tamil Brahmin man who embodied contradictions, the astronomer and the astrologer, one who saw no essential contradiction between the two. And then the poem about him, I quote, sky man in a manhole, with astronomy for dream, astrology for nightmare. Vinay Dharvatkar is alive to the poetry of these essays when he identifies what he calls the, I quote, ripple effect, a function of Ramanujan's poetic style as a writer of critical prose. The aesthetics of wit, humor, and polyphony have a condensing power that exceeds the reach of critical analysis. Spacious insights, are compressed into aphoristic phrases. Dharvatkar points to Ramanujan's fondness for the oblique and the indirect in the Sanskrit device of the Vakrokti, or crooked speech, which hides the serious under the mask of the playful. But Ramanujan's inspirations are eclectic. It is well known that for him, the ideal critical essay was one proposed by, by Walter Benjamin, where the scholar-critic hides behind I quote, a phalanx of quotations which, like highwaymen, would ambush the passing reader and rob him of his convictions, end quote. Ramanujan's construction of the essay as an anthology quotations has had ripple effects of its own in Indian literary thought. Amit Chaudhary described his 2001 edited collection, The Picador Book of Modern Indian Literature, which came with two introductory essays and unique biographical sketches preceding selections from each writer, as an essay with very long quotations. There is an artistic sensibility that lays out essays as a collage of stories, poems, and quotations, aphoristic turns of phrases that reveal the linguist and the folklorist. But this doesn't feel like the individual artistry of modern private creation that has defined the Western writer since Romanticism. There is something older something communal and performative in this artist, something that gleans its truth from myths and lores as much as the written word and scriptures, the textual and earthbound alike, the archived and the shapeless, the institutionalized as well as the grounded. Sometimes there is an eclectic effort uh, in the shapeless collectivity of the archive. At such moments, Ramanujan also avoids the role of the anthropologist, the narrative sensibility is such an organic part of the ethnography that nothing distinguishes the narrator from it. Nothing, perhaps barring his narration in English prose. He's a consummate folklorist, such a great collector of stories that he writes them anew in the very act of telling them. But these are also stories that become new in each telling. His widely discussed essay, one that much irked the Hindu rite, 300 Ramayanas, makes its point early through the tale of Rama's lost rings in the custody of the king of spirits in the netherworld. And I quote, there are as many Ramayanas as there rings on the platter, end quote. Which is essentially endless. The essay is an anthology of stories and poems, the poems quoted and the stories summarized. Stories of Ahalya, Jane retellings of the epic, linguistic variations, incarnations throughout Southeast Asia, frame stories, folk anecdotes, proverbs, and aphorisms. It spreads like a tableau, flowering open and out, without any of the linear unfolding of an argument, stated and done with right at the outset. Ramanujan just creates an anthology, a garland of folk art around it, here is a phalanx of stories and poems and sayings 
a delightfully curated museum of experiences cast in language. Curation as criticism, criticism as a museum, criticism as an art gallery. Is this because Ramanujan is a poet? But he was also many other things, a grammarian, a folklorist, a translator, and a prolific essays. All of this shaped and informed a critical sensibility. He was also very much an academic and a program builder. The shape and structure of the Department of South Asian Studies at the University of Chicago owes much to his presence and intervention, as indeed the larger American tradition of South Asian Studies. What then beyond what is idiosyncratically Ramanujan can account for this unique genre of criticism that bears the stamp of a polyphonic artist? Is it because he came from outside the Anglo-American tradition of literary criticism that was well entrenched in the academy by the time Ramanujan arrived in the US? This, I think, is one of the most compelling explanations of the strangeness of Ramanujan's criticism and his polyamorous art artistry. Criticism as an art form, as a genre of literature, had long become a bus tradition in the Anglo-American Academy from where Ramanujan was working. The strangeness of his criticism is the aura of this bus tradition, a forever vanishing alien aura. But a bus tradition implies a boom. What was booming at the time? Was criticism as art ever, do ever a dominant form in this space? That was the name of Arvind Krishna Mehrotra's failed dream about criticism and curation of literature by Indian academics. I quote, the essays, annotated ed editions, bibliographies that would become part of the literary landscape themselves, end quote, none of which Mehrotra mourned ever happened in this country. But what about the Anglo-American world? Was there ever a boom tradition of criticism as art? John Guillory has recently outlined that space within which criticism as an artistic and literary practice eventually went bust in the 20th century. The question of criticism as an artistic practice overlaps with that of criticism as a popular practice. But the two issues are also distinct from each other. Certain elements of literary style have historically shaped the popular life of criticism. But there have been others some of them radically experimental and Id idiosyncratic, that are difficult to incorporate into the space of the popular and the public. That space is also shaped by the political relevance or social urgency of issues discussed, or at least the appearance of urgency, increasingly more today. The artistic identity of criticism may or may not respond to the such urgencies. They part company just as easily as they come together. But Guillory implies that the two issues were closely linked to each other in the 19th century Anglo-American world of letters. This was the time when criticism meant a mode of writing in the public, journalistic sphere, rather than the university. University training was not crucial for the journalist critics who wrote for popular periodicals. Neither were they professionals in the sense of holding journalism degrees, which of course did not exist at the time, but rather in the sense they wrote for money. Their expertise, if indeed there was such a thing, was a matter of self-authorization. And it was not restricted to the literary. According to Guillory, I quote, such was the prestige of their discourse, we might say that all of literature aspired to the condition of criticism. In Arnold's famous phrase, the criticism of life, end quote. In the absence of a definite archive, Criticism came to be identified through a sensibility and a worldview often linked to particular practitioners, be it Arnold, John Ruskin, Walter Pater, or Oscar Wilde, author of the provocative work, The Critic as Artist. This was the time when criticism itself was a genre of literature and continued to be seen as such well into the 20th century. But as Guillory points out, the decline of the great periodicals deprived the supergeneric discourse of its institutional base. And soon, with the emergence of academic literary criticism in the 20th century, criticism came to be distinguished from literature. The poetic sensibility would continue to be central in the criticism of T.S. Eliot and the new critics, but the call to enshrine criticism as a professional discipline 
in the university would also come from one of them, John Crow Ransom, and that too in one of the great periodicals that continue to thrive to the present day, the Kenyan Review. And I quote Ransom here, criticism must become more scientific or precise and systematic, and this means that it must be developed by the collective and sustained effort of learned persons, which means that its proper seat is in the universities, end quote. With the, with, within the dwindling nostalgia for figures such as Susan Sontag, Lionel Trilling, Kenneth Burke, and the members of the New York School, criticism marked the university at its primary location and the literary as its specific archive and venue of expertise. The artistic and the experimental as the discourse of criticism moved to the radical margins of literary studies, notably to the space of feminist criticism, particularly from minoritized transnational or immigrant traditions, such as the work of Bell Hooks and Trin Menha. And if one looks beyond the Anglo-American tradition to figures such as Kamau Braithwaite and Gugi Watyango. In the meantime, what happened to the mainstream of academic criticism? What was the boom tradition there? A provocative set of answers was offered in 2017 by Joseph North. Ever since literary criticism became an institution and an university discipline, it had been driven by two distinct impulses, that of scholarship as a program of historical contextual study and that of criticism as a program of aesthetic education. Since the 1970s and 1980s, and particularly since Frederick Jameson's influential The Political Unconscious, the scholarly paradigm of historical contextual study has completely edged out the project of criticism as a means of aesthetic education. So one has one over the other. According to North, and I quote, there has been what I will call a scholarly turn by which scholarly approaches which have tended to treat literary texts chiefly as opportunities for cultural and historical analysis have replaced critical approaches which in their day had tended to treat literary texts as a means of cultivating the readers' aesthetic sensibilities, end quote. I disagree with not a little bit here. I don't see cultural historical analysis and the cultivation of aesthetic taste as isolated from each other to the extent he does. And I also have crucial differences with what he claims to be the political retreat and withdrawal of the scholarly tone. But it is difficult to deny the weight of his argument that the most influential movements in literary studies since the 1980s have assumed that the works of literature are chiefly of interest as diagnostic instruments for assessing the state of cultures in which they were written or read. One doesn't have to see historical diagnosis as aesthetic, as excluding aesthetic education. But even so, the primacy of the former as the defining critical enterprise since the late 20th century keeps it out of sync with the understanding of criticism as a genre of literature. A scholarly approach is more likely to read criticism and literature through the binary relationship of method and archive. But the perception of criticism as an artistic project or something that cannot be disentangled from the art instinct has little time for such a, bin such a binary. Criticism as a response to something, whether the formal, historical, aesthetic, or political quality of some phenomenon, remains its identifying mark. But this does not distinguish it from genres such as poetry and fiction, as they too respond to life, art, and everything in between. The remaining difference is merely one of genre, such as between poetry, fiction, and drama, rather than any final or defining difference between the intellectual and the artistic. Elements of both must shape all genres of literature, though the proportion will vary depending on the particular instance of practice. Is the artistic component of criticism a bust tradition in the second and third decade of the 20, 20, 21st century? I want to look beyond the return of critical enchantment by the work of art, of being hooked to it, to use Rita Felsky's term. An awareness of the stylistic component of criticism can run against, or at least at odd angles to the historical contextualist reading of literature even though a call for style is not necessarily an appeal to the aura of art. I'm engrossed by Michel Shaoli's reading of Rolla Barthes' book, Empire of Science, 
particularly the passages about Japanese food that he quotes from it. And I quote, Japanese rawness is essentially visual. It denotes a certain colored state of the flesh or vegetable substance, entirely visual. Food thereby says that it is not deep. The edible substance is without a precious heart, without a buried power, without a vital secret. No Japanese dish is endowed with a center. To eat is not to respect a menu, but to select with a light touch of the chopsticks, sometimes one color, sometimes another. End quote. Is this a description, an interpretation? Shaoli wonders. Elements of, of both are at play here, but not in the way we usually think of these processes. According to him, and I quote, the texture of flesh reveals the mystery of its colors, an end quote, which in turn brings out the very Sontagian re recognition that I quote, that quote again, truth itself, not in some unseen depth. Rather than scout the passage for meaning or seek to classify it, Shaoli wonders if indeed it would not be better to ask how the passage seeks to be heard or read. The conventional structures of criticism, that of the thesis and the argument, are not suited to such a passage. He remarks on its peculiar reflective texture. I quote, The text is a bit like the Japanese meal that it takes as its subject. Its depth reveals itself on its surface. End quote. Equally tantalizing is the trace of the personal across it, the signature of a subjective presence. Strikingly devoid of any first-person reference or even the particularity of an experience, the passage breeds the personal, the close presence of a living being. It holds the fullness of personality and its extinction at the same time. Omnipresent but invisible, the modernist signature of the artist across their art. Shaoli's large conception of style, he calls it, and I quote, a much broader phenomenon related to attitude, tone, mood, voice, and tact, is an important gesture for the recognition of criticism as a literary form. That is not his express intent in, his, in this essay, though in his book, Something Speaks to Me Where Criticism Begins, which came out last month, he speaks of a certain vulnerability before a work of art, a kind of stupefied silence. Something speaks to me, and I wish to speak about it, but I cannot, I fail. This silence is personal. This is what happens when a text addresses me personally, even though it really doesn't, that often it was composed many years, perhaps centuries before my birth. And yet I'm struck and stupefied because I feel it's calling out to me personally. Here is the breathing presence of the thinking, feeling subject of criticism, and a deliciously faltering one. Style is the name of the presence that breaks the binary of thought and feeling, experience and interpretation. Together, they enable criticism. To bring them together is to make a false claim, as they were never separate in the first place. But literary criticism and the academy has depleted the articulating subject and sought to efface them in the manner of the natural sciences. Newton's feelings and fear, his bodily discomfort during his work on gravitational physics are irrelevant, but literature is not physics. Why deny the anxieties and experiences of the critical subject? The particularity of experience is the soul of is the soul of criticism no less than it is the soul of art. We hear the idiosyncratic melody of the voice of great critics within just a few words. That melody matters just as much as the arguments that we may isolate from the particular context of their utterance. The melody, or for that matter, the dissonance, matters because experience of the encounter with art is as crucial to criticism as the interpretation we falsely separate from it. Interpretation is not what comes after we have cleaned up the mess of the encounter. True interpretation is what occurs in the encounter. Our epiphanies are shot through with sensitivities to meanings and engagements with objects. Particularity of experience and togetherness of thought emotion and sensation. These are the two things 
that have always defined the artistic for me. Everything else is technical. A distribution of genres by way of meter or syntax, length or performance, verse, prose, play. I'm not sure I agree with Shaoli's provocative sentence, and I quote, no definition will ever help us separate literature from non-literature, sculpture from non-sculpture, dance from non-dance, end quote. Representation and form, even when the form is dissonance, as in jazz, remain key for me as the markers of art. Criticism, too, seeks to represent the experience of an art object, and we have lost much of the plot of its form, as Shaoli has shown. I take the step that lies ahead. Criticism, when it lives a full life, is as inseparable from art as interpretation is from experience. The separation can be convenient for us, but that has nothing to do with how things really are. Literary traditions have always been bust, Amit Chaudhary says in the mission statement for the symposium. Is the practice or the imagination of criticism as art a bust tradition? Not in the modern story of its origin, such as the one told by Guillory. Criticism as criticism of life, in Matthew Arnold's formulation, was a genre of literature. Academia has turned literature as an archive to be mined. Criticism or scholarship that has increasingly displaced it has marked itself as distinct from literature. It is at once curiously secondary before the primacy of this archive and supreme in its hermeneutic power, the key to the lock of literature. Academic visibility has entailed the invisibility of the critic scholar, the trace of their subjectivity, the timber of their voice. Criticism as literature has gone underground, living there as a bus tradition. Its dereliction is rich enough for the project of literary activism. Thank you. Thank you very much Shilpur, for that really absorbing uh, presentation that spoke on behalf of the bust tradition of criticism as art but managed nevertheless to bring in academic criticism and writerly criticism onto the same page. Uh, you're not obviously dealing in binaries. You don't want to argue that one is black and the other is white. You want to see what you can arrive at with the material at hand. Uh, I will start off the discussion with just a couple of uh, thoughts that struck me as you were speaking, in fact. Um, you began with Ramanujan. And Ramanujan, Ramanujan, of course, was uh, a, a Kannada writer above and everything else, uh, above and beyond the, the, the critical work, the academic work, the university work, all of that. Um, you also mentioned Mehrutra when he uh, bemoans the fact that um, we haven't produced any good criticism in the universities. But he's talking, if you remember, about English departments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that allows me to ask you then what you make of this positioning, the, the manner in which you positioned Ramanujan outside of the Anglo-American tradition of criticism. What, how then would you, I'd like you to say a few words because perhaps you didn't have the time uh, in this uh, uh, presentation about uh, regional literatures, mm -hmm. about literatures that we write in the other, uh, that are written in the other Indian languages and whether in fact those literary fields and that literary culture in Hindi or Urdu or Bengali or Marathi whether whether those spaces actually do exist outside in a particular way and therefore allow uh, criticism as literature to continue to function almost as a subculture mm -hmm. but but it so just yeah. in, inviting a few yeah. reflections on the yeah. the literary field of indian writing in in indian languages that was one and the other one of course and then you took us to in the latter part of your uh, essay into this journey 
Well, you began with the 19th century, and you know, uh, so to my mind, immediately print culture, and 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 what that brought to my mind, which you didn't mention specifically, but I'm sure is there at the back of your head, is 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 um, were uh, publications such as the Edinburgh Review, for instance, you know, which then brings me to the review essay. So the review essay is something again that you haven't had the time to sort of speak about in this talk, mm -hmm. but we're not in the current incarnation in which the London Review of Books or the mm -hmm. New York Review of Books exists, or the New Yorker for that matter, but in the manner in which the review essay was practiced at one time, uh, um, and uh, and also so productively, say in Bengali, which is the language I know. Um, the essays of Bunkim Chandra on uh, a popular literature for Bengal, Bengali, 1870-71, you know. Um, these were review essays. They started out as review essays. And in fact, in one of the essays, he's reviewing himself. He brings himself into the, into, into, into the review. Um, so, no, so just, just asking you to say a few words on the languages and on the, the form of the review essay in relation to what you're saying really uh, uh, overall, and then we'll open it up to no, the audience. Those are they great questions. Be. And I think they are actually related. And I think, um, I think I mean, when I think of that, your, your own work comes to my mind, your work on Pramod Chaudhary, for instance, the, the chapter that you concluded to a connect, collection, Critic as Amateur, Critic as Roshik, as a kind of critic, as a kind of person immersed in a certain rasa. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's we. I think we've said this many times that so many of our um, sort of vernacular writers, Bhasha writers, were teachers of English literature, which is kind of quite interesting, obviously. And the University of Allahabad has a distinguished tradition for that. Harman Sarai Bachchan, you know, then there's in, in Kolkata, Jadapur, there's so many places they've, I mean, I think Buddha Dev uh, Boshu also taught, right? He taught Jivananda Dash, but they taught English. So it's very interesting that what they were doing and what they were talking about. Um, um, but uh, yeah, and periodicals definitely. I think I think again you've shown the emergence of a very Habermasian, almost kind of a public sphere, literary public sphere in nineteenth century Bengal through the periodicals. So there's been work or Shudipta Kubiraj, people have talked about that. I think it's quite fascinating when I think of universities, I think of two disciplines, history and English. And they seem to present kind of almost opposite pictures. It seems to me history has been this great research discipline, and this might be a bit controversial as I say this, but I'm saying this, it's a very, especially saying it at the IAC, great research discipline generating a lot of great research which is recognized globally and a complete pedagogic failure. I'm sure there are honorable exceptions, great teachers, but generally history is doesn't draw that many students to the classroom. And it seems like English has been kind of the opposite. It has been a great pedagogic discipline you know, going back from De Rosio and down to inspiring teachers, you know, I can think of so many in Calcutta alone. Um, but I think research in the sense, but then again, the question becomes, what, how, what do you define as research? I mean, maybe because of my training, I think of research very much in the American sense, the whole Hopkins, you know, frame, the Humboldtian model of research, which I think is now very shaky right now, whether that even has any future, what is the future of humanities, all of that is so that question cannot be answered with confidence, the way say an economist can say, oh, these are the directions in economics. So it's the whole enterprise is so shaky. And there is a kind of a return to, okay, popular criticism, there's a whole anxiety, a lot of semi-public venues, those are coming up. But um, I have a feeling there is a lot of very interesting criticism in in the Indian languages, again, like you, I also read Bangla, and I can think of so many, so many essays. I mean, obviously, Rabindranath, as we know, is as well known for his essays as for his poems and songs and anything. Bonkin Chandra, Sharad Chandra, all of them wrote so many essays. Um, I don't think contemporary Bangla writers quite write as much. There's again that, but I'm sure in any other tradition, I'm not really an expert on the different linguistic traditions of India. That has completely happen. But I think there's a, I think for some reason we envision the university teacher of literature as a teacher. We tend to think of them as pedagogues. The idea of, and I think that's not a bad thing, but um, so the kind of writing life of the teachers is not quite visible in the way, I guess, it's in the Anglo-American Academy. So I don't know, that's a rambling kind of an answer. No, that's fine. I was actually gesturing more towards the closing down of space for the review essay. That that in yeah. the Anglo-American sphere, the review essay as it used to exist no longer 
as a spy, except except for some a few uh, journals like N plus one, right. which which right. you know can't compare with the a boom of so the bust tradition of N plus one against the mm. boom of the NYRB. Right. Uh, but but the the idiosyncratic review essay uh, yeah. seems to have been. I mean, New York will publish to, review essays. I mean, yes. more of Emre's review it's essay of particular Gillery's book, all. actually. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The, but yeah. but very policed. In, in, oh yeah, New Yorkers. The style yes. is very policed. Even the sentences, the words. It's a it's a kind of very formulaic Which thing. Militates against criticism as art, I think. Right. Of course. Absolutely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. The house style, yeah. So my question is like in Terry, like in Terry Gilton's book, he mentions that like literary criticism as a as an art is dying, right? And in that sense, taking that forward and uh, your presentation on that, uh, like in many of the universities, say for example, Ashoka, that act of literary criticism has been replaced with kind of like more argumentative that you have to prove something uh, uh, by your reading of a text mm. or a certain theoretical underpinning that you see in the text right and in that sense like the kind of essays that Virginia Woolf for example wrote or let's say A.K. Ramanujan wrote mm. that kind of or that style of essay is not seen anymore it's more like oh you'll have to perhaps uh read uh, like do an uh like a colonial sort of uh imagination against imagination reading of rhyme of the ancient man it's kind of like that that becomes the case right and in that sense would you perhaps say that this kind of writing would itself be out uh, like this decline in that sort of writing would be like in the context of a certain anxiety uh, to, um, or also sort of an attempt to present uh, in English studies, literary studies as this sort of um, as something uh, sort of catering to like mass needs or presenting itself as this sort of a humanistic social sciences kind of a thing because Again, we could sort of then create a distinction between a, a social science, let's say history paper or a sociology paper mm. as sort of uh, giving arguments. This were the case and these are the instances out of like my research. But with literature, that uh, can be the case, but mm. that, it also has its own alternative in the form of literary criticism that we see, let's say, in the writing of Virginia Woolf or E.K. Ramanujan, uh, like that's uh, that's right, yeah. John Ruskin. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, since you mentioned Ashoka, I have to say that that kind of essays are therefore left to the provenance of the creative writing department, where we definitely encourage, and I think all of us, there are writers who also mm -hmm. criticize, who also talk about craft, who also write. We write poems, novels, other things, but we also do that. So I think we definitely also teach that. In my class, uh, introductory class to the creative writing program is now the reading for writers. And we read texts, we write essays, we write creative responses. So other ways to think about texts which are not academic. But the main thrust of your question that why, I think it's absolutely right. There's a, what I also mentioned in my paper, there's a kind of a science model. I think the basic research structure of, again, I know American University is the best, is modeled on sciences. You know, the kind of, and the whole depletion of the personal, the whole kind of factual. And then if you look at disciplines globally, uh, even the social sciences have become way more quantitative, you know, over the last 30, 40 years. Economics used to be a humanistic discipline probably in the 60s and 70s. Now it's almost inseparable from mathematics. Same with sociology. It has moved away. It studies human behavior. And this has a long lineage with positivism and Durkheim, that how positivism had to be enacted through the social sciences. So it, it has become very quantitative. It is probably more quantitative in the U.S. than in Europe, but still it's generally quantitative. Um, and um, and I think that model has invariably seeped into literary studies. You know, it is very much there. Certainly for one thing, I think in India, that model became dominant primarily through the institution of JNU, which was established with a social scientific vision, the Nehru's vision. And in India, social sciences have gone hand in hand with the nation building project, also the responsible talking about a nation and JNU was very much part of that vision and the school of languages was kind of an appendage to the social sciences so and then cultural studies so and I think even generally if you see look at you know books or anything reviewed they are reviewed for oh what is the importance of the subject 
you know this is about an important subject you know and then and as exactly what we are talking about even reading like people like nair masood and all would not be given any review space you know if that was the criteria that is the subject of importance to nation building so but that is again a social scientific strain which i think has been very strong in india always partly to do with its status as a post colonial nation or something else or whatever and that is what we see and then you know obviously theory makes it very easy because theory is a very powerful tool i think it's if you know a little bit of theory it's possible to look very clever even in writing or in speech and that's a temptation that's hard to resist anywhere i think david lodge has written very funny novels about it and so that is definitely there so yeah absolutely that is it's 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 uh, disciplines can't keep themselves free from neighboring disciplines but sometimes the effects are good and sometimes they're not so good <laughs> so i'm always reminded of uh, uh, the introductory page of vasudha dalmeya and stuart blackburn's uh, edition of uh, uh, indian literatures where they actually said that uh, literature now should uh, do the same thing that geertz did in uh, interpreting the balinese cockfight they actually <laughs> mentioned that particular essay and they said this is what uh, uh, literary history or literature uh, uh, you know uh, is <laughs> the turn this yeah. is this is and this i is hope sociological we are capacious enough to accommodate many approaches i mean there's digital humanities and all that so that's fine but this should not vanish this tradition should not vanish that's all i'm saying yeah, so thank you so much for your um wonderful talk uh, to close up the symposium as well um i had a couple of uh, questions segueing from uh, what professor rosinka brought up mm -hmm. um one on the vernacular and the other on uh, uh calling forward clifford gates again mm -hmm. right um so i'm just thinking um across this sense of wanting to bridge um fiction and criticism and yeah. a certain kind of theoretical drive or impulse right uh, to making that accessible in quote and quote a certain kind of legitimacy or a certain sphere of legit legitimacy right um do you see any purchase then in dialoguing with disciplines um such as anthropology again mm. uh, where mm. you have these methods of writing called uh, ficto criticism and i think that's uh, by michael tossig if i'm not right mm -hmm. um if i'm not wrong um so i'm just very curious um is the direction that the bus tradition seeking criticism as art is the direction that you see this going or or a certain shall we say hopeful impulse of this mm. do you think um it involves a certain kind of movement across disciplines uh, kind of mm. not necessarily ransacking them for their methods mm -hmm. but also at the same time uh, opening up to more anees uh, and and mm. a lot more uh, open ended questions as such yeah, yeah. no absolutely i am a huge fan of um you know disciplines neighboring i mean anthropology since you mentioned it has always been a big inspiration for me i mean it was a huge inspiration in the writing of my first book which was on prose of the world which was on boredom and literature uh, because no discipline you know other than anthropology has done such fascinating work on recording the quotidian the ordinary and even written on boredom as anthropology has you know so it was definitely there tossig and many of the people i i i actually used them but on the other hand i don't think i'd have been interested in a topic like boredom if if i wasn't a novelist you know the a choice of the topic was very novelistic of course once you decide what to work on you can draw on things i think i would have written on something more responsible like nation or race or the kind of things which matter but i wanted to write about boredom as i was saying as i said that oh i had this vision of getting caught in a traffic jam and that and interestingly i mean the book was reviewed uh, in the times literary supplement the reviewer picked out that passage and said that oh, only in the end does it give his personal story um and the, this book is essayistic which is kind of the kiss of death for you know academic books but it's always been even even this book amateur is about you know people who fail exams people who sit in the last bench who read their own books so there has to be some kind of image but once you get it how you like again this in this book history historiography has played a big role so i think absolutely social sciences anthropology is a discipline i absolutely love i mean i was recently on a search committee external member of an anthro search committee and i love the way anthropologists are amazing story storytellers you know the way they kind of archive and they sort of live through things um but 
I think when you read a poem or a novel anthropologically, uh, that is different, I think, from reading it, you know, reading it in a kind of looking for something else as we look for, you know, um, I think anthropo his, so, social studies are in the end, I think Deepa Chakraborty puts it very well when he talks about, uh, you know, in the end, um, you know, why can't history account for uh, the speech of the Santal, the tribal, because Santal will say, oh, I uh, I didn't fight this war, God fought this war. And uh, and history can't say that. History can't say God fought a war. History is rational. And that's exactly where Mahasha Devi can write a story saying, we don't know what happened, what's going on, they're playing a trick. Literature is free from the responsibilities of the public sphere. And Chakravarti is saying that, oh, history has to be cited in law courts, it has to have a certain responsibility. We are not responsible. We can be responsible. We don't have to be. We can write a story saying no one knows what's going on in somebody's head. It could be God. It could be no, it could be devil. But that freedom. So I think I think it's important to remember. So I think some social scientists are they always draw on literature. I, I've noticed that. But it is possible to read literature in a reductive way so that you kind of go to the goal you want to. And we also use social sciences. I've used anthropology, I've, I've used history, but my impulses have always been kind of more playful and idiosyncratic, which I don't think always jives with the social science method. Uh, thank you very much. That was very uh, thought provoking. And uh, I I tend to like sympathize very much with the idea of uh, not opposing, but making, uh, marking the shift between this kind of research done as inquisitio, as inquisition, where you have to prove things, mm. that it's the method of, of the sciences. And, uh, and, and obviously to prove everyone else that you're right has nothing to do with the humanities. Mm. You can prove everyone else that you're right and having said nothing so whatsoever. Uh, the humanities is about understanding, not about proving. And to understand is to comprehend something and to share a view about things. Mm. Uh, obviously, this is not something new. Uh, it has existed for a long time. Uh, the positive, this German philology already uh, introduced in the humanities department this idea of proving and provoked the most hilarious uh, uh, humor in history, like searching urtex for oral poetry or uh, reordering propertious elegies because they thought they had fallen down and been I mean, put in the wrong order when the jumps of subject of proportions are completely meaningful. Uh, so uh, then you have a different, a very different tradition where you have like people like our Bachar, other people that actually they don't pay attention, as you say, to subject, mm -hmm. but pay attention to style. And style is precisely something that escapes uh, statistics, mathematics. Mm -hmm. I mean, mathematical stylistics is the most horrendous <laughs> subject in the sense that. Normally, style is defined by something, by something a little bit. It's like a caricature. Is something little that it makes a difference, mm. but it's not normally very present or, or statistically significant. It's something that uh, it might be a, a little different. Sorry, but this was just a comment. Uh, my question goes somewhere else, and I'm going to be brief. Sorry, um, I want to take you some somewhere else. Is that you started talking about uh, this idea of Schlegel of poetry being the only mm. one that can criticize poetry, uh, which points to a very important moment in the history of the arts, which is when uh, the art emancipates from this kind of uh, classical poetics where the norms of the works of art were outside. So you will complain and you could judge a work of art by, by just looking, okay, they have to you have unity of time or whatever. Uh, and then suddenly what he's saying by that notion of universal progressive poetry is that Art from now on is going to contain in itself its own criticism. So it's going to mm -hmm. contain the, the conditions, the formal conditions under which the work of art is going to be understood in itself. So if you're proposing now, uh, which I completely sympathize with the idea, but if you're proposing art criti uh, uh, the criticism of art as uh, art, I mean, like, like, mm -hmm. like uh, or maybe I'm, I'm not paraphrasing very well, um, that doesn't mean, I, under, I mean, under that parameter, that wouldn't only mean that you're going to do an uh, an arty text about a work of art uh, or a sensible text about a work of art that is not going to be like mathematical, but it will also mean in those terms that that art criticism should include in itself the formal conditions under which is understood. And that, uh, my question has to do with that, can you identify certain like 
typical behaviors, stylistic behaviors, mm -hmm. formal behaviors, uh, that will define the kind of art criticism you are advocating. You started also saying that you always start from an image. And an image can be just uh, an objective presentation of something, but uh, images in the way that literature normally refers to are ways of linking, are ways of synthesizing, are, way, are way, ways of putting things together, like in a, a metaphor would put something together by similarity and indifference or montage by direct juxtaposition or parallelism by correlation. So I was wondering, when you speak about image, uh, is it only like like a certain impression or is a way of behaving, a way of linking, a way of synthesizing? And would you recognize in the kind of art criticism you are advocating some typical formal behaviors uh, that would, uh, I, oh, obviously there might be very different ones, but mm -hmm. some of them that you would identify and you will feel like part of your own uh, your own work uh, and your own task as a, as a writer. Mm, so, yeah. yeah, it's a great question, but obviously I, it's a question which the answer is a work of in a work in progress because it's a, you know, I wish one could arrive at the destination that easily. It's a difficult one. Uh, for me, I think uh, it's not just an image but a sensation. I need that physical feeling, that atmospheric sense of something that has always driven me as a novelist that has always driven me as a writer of criticism too that sense of and um i i think that's the origin story i mean um i mean obviously i when i started this thought about the amateur the 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 the, the essay that really inspired me was one by pankaj mishra uh, called the edmund wilson in benares where he failed to write fail to write something and that failure that image of that failure recounted in very personal terms and obviously i have had a long attachment with all these negative motives failure boredom ignorance which is why bust is where i feel I naturally belong this is it's going on for a long time that kind of and that is um, that is attractive that is attractive to me what form it will take is a Really difficult question. It's a really difficult question. I don't think I want to lay down. I mean, obviously, I, I, you know, I think what I'm saying is roughly what Shaoli tries to say. It should somehow carry the personality of the critique. You know, that is there. Now, that being said, everybody has a different personality. Everybody chooses different ways to articulate their personality. So there's no one formula for it. I mean, just to give an example, I actually learned to write like this. I have been, I've written two novels and one critical book and they never came together for me. They started to come together for me when I started writing op-ed articles for newspapers. You know, and that is where I felt I am intervening in a public issue, but on personal terms. You know, I just wrote something about something political, but again, driven by an image. So that personal voice gets me into it. But that's just my way. I think everybody will have to find their own way. Everybody will have to find. But I think the culture of training that tells you to efface the personal completely. And some of that is actually essential because often people come from high school. They're like, they're all about me, all about me. And I think that is only going up more and more. So we do need to tell them to you know, look at archive. But I think once we have reached a certain responsible moment, you need to, again, teach people to bring a voice out. And finding a voice is actually very, very difficult. Finding a voice is not talking about myself. You know, you exactly. It's not autobiographical. It's personal. I can talk about something completely different without, as, as that Barth passage. There's no mention of I, and yet it's intensely personal. So those things are very difficult. But, I mean, for me, it took me a long time to you know, arrive there. So I don't always recommend this in the undergraduate or even the graduate classroom. But um, there should be some place for it, I think, in the conversations about criticism in the academy, in the public sphere. That that space is not there, I think. Um, so I uh, just want to quickly um, uh, um, say something, uh, uh, make an observe. Uh, no, actually, just add something to what, what was being talked about in terms of criticism in Indian languages. And then uh, I want to make a couple of observations, uh, which maybe you could respond to. Uh, it was a lovely talk. I mean, that goes without saying I really liked it. And I, um, uh, I read, I, I think you had sent it to me. So um, 
I, uh, I, I liked it when I first read it as well. Um, the 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 com the comment was to do with uh, the, recently uh, we had a, uh, an academic called Orko Chattopadhyay speak mm -hmm. about Nobarun Bhattacharya, the novelist Nobarun Bhattacharya, in uh, a, a, for Ashoka University and a new online series on Indian writers, uh, and and he said that we 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 are uh, I'm uh, editing uh, two anthologies, one in Bangla and one in English, mm -hmm. on Nobarun Bhattacharya and. Um, the Bangla one is a mix of academic uh, writing and essays. Mm -hmm. The English one is all academic writing. Uh, he was just saying this almost as a, he made this throwaway remark about the fact that it was it, it had been difficult to find essays in English by in, uh, people who, who could have written essays about Nobarun Bhattacharya in English. So I, I pursued that for a second. I said, but in Bangla, you found people who chose the essay form. So that tells us something about the difference in these cultures mm -hmm. and practices and the ongoing sort of practices, even today, coming from a, a tradition that probably existed earlier. Critical essay, the critical essay. Okay. Now, the observations. First, since the word anthropology came up, um, thank you so much for bringing it up. And yeah, I mean... Some 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 philosophy, some of the things which are now called philosophy, of course, were were sort of not called philosoph philosophy at all in the philosophy departments, as we know. The 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 deconstruction began to thrive in literary departments. So talking about neighboring uh, departments and uh, you know how they uh, not only enter but uh, but are legitimized and given a fresh life. Actually, their 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 life in philosophy, deconstruction's life in philosophy, for a long time was. In the philosophy department was illegitimate. It was legitimized in the English departments, according to many. Um, and I've certainly met irate uh, European philosophers who have ranted against Derrida and and said that this is not philosophy at all. And Foucault, maybe, you know. So uh, this is this was in the nineties that I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, however, I mean the 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 the, the thing I'm talk uh, I'm sort of want want to draw attention to here is. And something like anthropology, which again served as an escape route, let's say, a long time ago to a, a writer like Ted Hughes, who switched in Cambridge from studying English and the, because he didn't take, didn't think it was doing very much for him to anthropology, um, given the kind of interests he had as a writer. But by now, by by the eighties, uh, by the late eighties, an anthropology and related social science disciplines become an elite metropolitan discourse when we are taking when we are when we are studying anthro anthropology or, or some of one of the uh, any one of the other social science disciplines uh, from the late 80s onwards we are also partaking of a an elite metropolitan academic conversation um, there's no way of eliding it you know you you are not arriving auth authoritatively at this anthropological standpoint outside of that discourse. This, uh, this discourse is also, um, what, what, what kind of characterizes the discourse, at least as far as my encounters with it in India are concerned? It, it, I, I would say it's an overdetermined interpretative consciousness. So that if, I, if I'm looking through the lens of anthropology as a novelist, at a man entering a lift in a building, then I'm dwelling on the fact that there's a Ganesh calendar hanging in the lift. And, I'm, and I'm, then my overdetermined consciousness is struck by this Ganesh calendar for various cultural reasons and leading to various cultural readings. So I would say that this particular social science anthropological reading is, is not only a problem in the departments of anthropology, but the way it has entered a certain kind of sensibility in the Indian novel, hmm. where, where we encounter a, a, both this sensibility and an inability to leave the Ganesh calendar alone and just describe it as it is. Hmm. Uh, to go back to Kafka's exactitude, hmm. to, to describe whether it's a Ganesh calendar or whether it's a giant insect, to just take it as it is. Going back to the calm that hmm. we mentioned earlier. 
or the arches yeah not, so arches. not get agitated by taking part in this other conversation mm -hmm. where we where the overdetermined sort of uh, trained mind of a particular kind training also being a mark of that mm -hmm. particular elite discourse begins to interpret uh, um, mm -hmm. and is unable to leave the detail alone it leads for a very different kind of fiction it leads for a very different kind of aesthetic that's that's one thing uh, uh, and the last thing that i wanted to mention is since you bring it up again and again and since michelle charlu's book i'm reading too brings it up now the whole business of let's bring the subject back mm. to the to 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 literary criticism let's not pretend that like the sciences mm. there is no person over here mm. uh, i i think that i completely agree with you maybe that needs a little tweak because we are obviously not talking about bringing the person back in the sense of you know people reading in book clubs to read about themselves in in books we are trying to um we have to tackle this onerous and pervasive problem of identification reading for identification which 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 mm -hmm. sort of um you know uh, um arises from a particular hmm. uh, um, sort of tyranny of the subject hmm. uh, or a vulgarization of the subject. You know, you know uh, I dislike that character in the book. I wanted to slap that character. You, we, you hear that kind of uh, ch chatter in book clubs and in comment sections or, or maybe in, in the comment boxes of Amazon as well. There the subject, there's a vulgarized idea of the subject. I don't think that's what you're talking about. No. Yeah. So that, I mean, that, particular. Yeah. I think the right word is particular. When you feel there's a unique, but the you can signify the particular without signaling a subject. And that's why I think Charlie's criticism of that bath passage is interesting. That the first person doesn't come in. What I did, what I ate, it's not there. But you know, the description is kind of wandering around, following a particular strain of thought. That invisibility. I mean, that Stephen Dedalus, that the artist is present everywhere. That is what I'm talking about. So I think maybe the personal is not always the right word to use, but a particular signature. And very quickly on the question of the sociological, I think this is also extremely easy to transport, you know, like, oh, I I'm, I really don't want to talk about this novel. What I want to talk about is global warming. But this book is actually a very convenient vehicle to talk about global warming. So let's choose this book. You know, so I'm not interested in any formal choices, characters, nothing there in the book, but I want to get to the issue. So the book as a vehicle of a so social issue, and that has become very common, uh, both in public spaces, um, journalistic spaces, and in the academy, because people are choosing, they're teaching problems. They're not teaching books, they're teaching problems. And that is the easy thing to do. Okay, I, I'm going to get an article about, you know, something, you know, some socially urgent issues. So it's that is just a peg on which to hang. So I think that's why it's very easily reproducible. <laughs> yeah, there's a boom in that. Yeah. Um, last question. Oh, but that was fascinating. I worry that I've that I've something that is very literal is, has to be a question. But um, so you spoke about criticism as art, and uh, by way of Shaoli, who uses the example of baths and a sensuous prose to hint at the possibility of a criticism that is art in itself. I'm wondering about art produced with the objective of criticizing. Do you suppose fiction may be written with the objective of being? Uh, criticism instead of narrative or whatever else it might be. Mm -hmm. That is my first yeah. question. And my second question, again, very literal, is uh, emerges from um, the Schlegel uh, mm -hmm. reference. But do you suppose criticism may be achieved in verse instead of prose? I mean, mm -hmm. as a writer of prose, mm -hmm. I mean, I have only ever read criticism in prose do you think it can be achieved in words hmm. um, yeah. isn't the popes and s didn't alexander pope try that essay on criticism i think people have people and that's a great question but i think that must have been tried. i mean there's so much of wordsworth which is critical there's so much of 
you know, there's so much of, I mean, so much of what philosophy is um, sort of articulated in in verse, but that's a that's a really interesting question. I mean, um, um, what was the first question? Sorry, I forgot. The, the quick. Fiction being written with. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that is obviously more obvious with fiction. I think we were talking yesterday also. Um, I think uh, after Andre's talk, uh, the subject of the novel of ideas came up, and there's a, obviously a distinguished European tradition of the novel of ideas. So there is that. I mean, I often teach. Um, uh, text from uh, James Kudzia's Elizabeth Costello, which is some people call it a novel. I don't know why people call it a novel. It just seems to me sketches and lectures sort of put in a fictional mode. What I find interesting in those texts is often they'll stage a polemic, often they'll stage an argument, and then the characters will do something that will completely belie that argument. Yeah, so there's kind of a contradiction. So there's a kind of a, the thesis kind of comes off fragmented. You know, they... And I think that is the play, that is the sense of play, which is really important, that you cannot just go at a thesis in a kind of a linear way. You seem like you're presenting a point and then you just completely mischievously blow it all apart. It, I think that sense of play is really interesting. I mean, I think uh, Omkar is here. We've discussed novel in Africa in our class where that, that Elizabeth and Ugu, they're talking about their lectures and then it turns out in the end there's a total anticlimax that they have a history be between them i think that is that is very important that i'm not going for an argument i look like i'm going for an argument but yeah i'm actually there's i have something else up my sleeve don't trust me so that element of slyness and mischief should not kind of ever be gone from that is interesting it makes you think about things it makes you think about things in an argumentative way without necessarily being pushed into the shoot of an argument Um, thank you so much, Professor Mojumdar and Professor Chaudhary, for this great uh, final concluding session as well as a great conversation. And uh, in his opening remarks yesterday, Professor Amit Chaudhary did say that the symposium is also burst in the sense that these conversations don't go anywhere. But I did mention right after the first uh, talk by Professor Andres Claro that uh, the symposium is cyclic, that these conversations do speak to the previous mm -hmm. symposiums. Uh, so did yours, uh, not only to the conversations that have happened over the uh, two days, as well as two previous symposiums, and particularly the last symposium, which is fresh in my memory on the right of critic and literary studies. So uh, thank you again to both of you, and thanks to all of you. Before we uh, leave and uh, uh, say our goodbyes, I would like to invite Professor Amit Chaudhary uh, for his concluding remarks, and thank you again. Thank you. Uh, uh, I. I've never made concluding remarks before. There was a, a colleague of mine at uh, the University of East Anglia, John Cook, who used to do an amazing job of not just making concluding remarks, but giving a, like a concluding talk where he summarized what everybody had said beautifully. You know, and you know, I I can't do that. I, but uh, um, but Shoykot said. John Cook used to give concluding remarks. You must give con make concluding <laughs> remarks. So, so, so here I am. Uh, fine. I, all I can say, I, I'll speak in vague uh, sort of uh, optimistic generalities and say that um, it, it it's been uh, a wonderful uh, to do this symposium yet again and uh, to sort of again submit to the fact that it works on its own terms. It it cannot be orchestrated. I cannot. No one can do that. It somehow comes off simply because we take that risk. Uh, and I sort of also invite people who I think will have in some way be open to saying something on the subject. Uh, and these are people who are not professionally allied to any particular subject which I'm professionally putting forward. And maybe that's why it works. I don't know. But it's the ninth time it's worked among nine symposiums. The 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 conversations are important i think that some of them are on youtube some of them uh, are papers that appear now on the literary activism website they will now begin to be anthologized uh, as part of these li in the literary activism uh, Im imprint and 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 show this sort of this conversation that sanchit was talking about that each symposium has with other uh, symposiums against storytelling, on failing, the writer, critic, and literary studies. These are ongoing uh, conversations. Um, so um, 
I should thank Ashoka University, of course. It started out with the University of East Anglia, but Ashoka University has generously supported this very idiosyncratic venture. Uh, maybe they don't know what's going on over here. So let's let's hope that is the case. <laughs> so so uh, you know this is the, the this is happening with their support with and with the partnership of IIC. Uh, again, uh, a bit of living history, I think, uh, in Delhi. And uh, with the audience, whoever they might be, and this time an online audience as well, I would say, and I've never said this before, the speakers, uh, I, I mean, for, for allowing themselves to be part of a conversation to which they may or may not have, or they most probably do not have any professional sort of affinity with that particular subject. They're having to think in what way they're related to the subject. And this happens time after time. I have to uh, thank the speakers and, of course, the chairs in uh, making these conversations happen, making them begin and happen. So um, until next year, um, thank you. Thanks to all of you. Bye. And 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 Sanchit, we have to have we have to thank Sanchit. <laughs>